both pride and dignity stop on your own order. Welcome to the Premier TV. Well, today I'm on the bus to Abingdon. I'm actually um, I'm heading to see a, a chap who lives in Abingdon called Nick Hayes, and um, he sounds like a very interesting bloke. He's a ufologist who um, has gathered some amazing evidence. If if it turns out the evidence he's professed is correct, and that is basically why I'm going to visit him. He lives in Abingdon, which is in Oxfordshire, just south of the city of Oxford. It's only a short distance from where I live, so it's very, very easy to get there and to talk to him. So um, I'm going to head there now and see what he has to say. But in the meantime, let's have a look at his book. And here it is, Quest for the Invisible. The Invisibles, pardon me, the discovery of unseen craft and beings that reside in the invisible world all around us. There's some of Nick's top pictures. Nick Hayes. Invisibles, this unseen craft. There exists an entire world around us that cannot be seen. The human eye sees only about 22.5% of the electromagnetic spectrum. Some of the people have questioned. We can pause and read this, ladies and gentlemen, but it looks like a really good book. Published by the book tree. That's good, so uh well done. It's quite it's not a long book, as you can see it's quite thin. And I did read it. It only takes like a few hours to read actually. It's but it's it's very good. I did have a read of it. Yay. <laughs> well ladies and gentlemen, this is Nick, this is Nick Hayes. I'm here with him. Hi hey, so uh, Nick, thanks for being on Babano TV. Oh it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure, believe me. It's good to have you on. And now um, I've been having a little read through this little book here. This is Nick's book here, Quest for the Invisibles, which I do recommend. And um, I wanted to meet up with you and talk to you. And seeing as, um, mm. seeing as I live so close, yeah. I thought it would be good to, to get you now. Um, Nick, your, your UFO experience started with, um, with an amazing close encounter. So maybe that's a good place to start this story. Yeah, yeah. Well, basically, I was walking the dogs, uh, one of my dogs actually, on um, Christmas Day evening 2009. About quarter past seven, um, and I was just about to go down an alleyway to get home, and one of the dogs decided that he wanted to go back down one of the alleyways I've already been, so decided to, you know, let him have the benefit of the doubt because I wasn't sure why he wanted to go down there. Just as we got down the bottom, I just happened to look up, and there was a, it was a very cloudy sky, and you couldn't see the difference between the fog on the ground and the, and the sky, and all of a sudden there's a pocket where there's no fog, and all of a sudden. Look, I saw this pink haze coming through the fog um, and I watched it for several minutes, it seemed like an eternity and then all of a sudden a craft like UFO, what I consider was a craft at the time, just floated on by at no more than walking pace um, and I just stood looking at it um, then I ran down the road so I could get in front of it again to watch it go over the top of me again um, and then I proceeded to follow it, it went diagonally across a housing estate which meant I had to take another road so I went down the park and it stopped right above a tree and I just looked at it for several minutes and then um, I realised I hadn't got a camera so I decided to run all the way home to get a camera hoping it was still there. Oh dear. So, which was about, you know, Never have cameras run. when you need them, do you? No, <laughs> so, no. This is typical for any sort of paranormal yeah. stuff, you know. It's, it's almost like there's, it's almost like the, the phenomena itself is evading, it's almost it, like it is evading detection. Yeah, well, the problem was I got a brand new camera that day for Christmas, um, Casio camera, and it's the first camera I'd ever owned and I spent all day taking pictures of everything from the pets, you know, plants, and I got sick of it, so I just like left it in the coat, my other coat, um, and then sods law as I went out without, you know, that mm. coat on. Um, but I ran all the way home anyway, um, with the dog in tow, dropped the dog off, and ran all the way back down there again, and could see no trace of it at all. So I spent the rest of the night um, walking around, hoping this thing was going to appear again. So I decided to go home and get my other dog. So you know, an hour had gone by this, this, this you know, since then. Got the other dog, went back up, and all of a sudden I saw it in the distance, but not where I expected it to be. And I just managed to get a few frames of, I mean, I took lots of photographs, but it was just so far away and it was blurry, and I kept dropping the camera because it was pitch dark. I was actually in a riverbank, and every time I slipped down the riverbank, I dropped the camera. And, mm -hmm. um, but in the end, I managed to get at least one good frame, which showed the general outline, and that's what you can see in the book. Yeah. We'll show you a, we'll show you a, um, a, a proper image of that now. Okay. So, um, now that this is um, amazing. Now, the people, I think the first question would be is this was actually quite close to your home, which is where we are mm. now, which is in Abingdon, Oxfordshire. You look at it on the map, it's quite a sizable town, 80,000 people, lots of residential streets and tightly packed houses. Um, you were the only one who saw it. 
As far as I know, mm -hmm. I mean, I expected it to be on the radio the next day and on the news and in the papers. You know, because the thing was, it was it was heading. I worked out, I plotted it on a map, and it was heading straight towards the army base, which is um, just outside um, Abingdon, at Dalton Barracks. That's right, near the. Um, um, you know, I considered Rogers ringing, called, yeah. considered ringing the police. Um, I was that freaked, not freaked out, but it was like, oh my god, oh my god. I felt like ringing on everyone's door, saying UFO, UFO, UFO. But the fact was, it was Christmas Day evening, and. Most people were inside. Well, there you are. No dog walkers anywhere. Mm. That could it. be that could be one of the reasons why nobody saw it. And also, yeah. you talk about the weather conditions. Um, it was a thick fog, yeah. definitely a thick fog. And it came so low, you couldn't even tell the difference between the sky and and the, the ground fog. Um, but every now and then, you'd see like a, a gap in in the uh, in the clouds mm. where you could see the sky. But we're in the Thames Valley here, and our fogs are absolutely famous. They get very thick, especially in winter pea when it's super. cold. Yeah, you get real pea supers all over the Thames Valley. <laughs> and I mean, it's quite possible, I, because I live in Oxford City, I've been in fogs like this, it's quite possible that something can come down low, then ascend to a higher altitude where it's invisible from the ground. And being Christmas Day, of course, you were probably one of the few people out and about. Yeah, I did so, see uh, I mean, I normally see half a dozen dog walkers, mm. but there wasn't one dog walker at all. Then again, another thing, I mean, that's, this could, that alone could explain why you were the only witness. Yeah. But another... Um, is another part of it is what Jenny Randall's a, a ufologist um, who studies a lot of Rendlesham Forest and things like that. Mm. She called the Oz factor, right. which is in a sense that people who have these experiences often it's almost like they they enter a different world, and that the normal rules of reality don't work while they're having this. They're in the middle of these experiences. Yeah, because there's lots of people <clears throat> who have. I know I've spoken to a lot of people. And I know a lot of cases where people have seen UFOs over a built-up area, sometimes in the middle of the day, on a busy road sometimes, when they're mm -hmm. driving along, yeah. and no one else sees it. And sceptics, of course, will, will say that that means it's a figment of your imagination. But, of course, I don't accept that. And as Randalls has said, there's something more going on, which may be more interesting, as if they only appear to certain people at certain times. Yeah, yeah, well, it was very overwhelming. I must admit, it was very dreamlike. I even pinched myself a couple of times, you know, and just to see if I was dreaming or not, it was just so full on that, you know, I keep looking at it, I can see it now like it happened yesterday. It's just mm. overwhelming. But the first thing I thought when I saw it was it looked, reminded me of a child's spinning top. Um, and a cross between that and a lampshade. Um, and it was like a red light, it went from red to orange. It was almost like a breathing tone, sort of like... Mm. It changed colour, was it? Like a breathing tone, it, it got more, you know, went brighter and then went back down, faded again. But it was almost like it was breathing. And it didn't look like a craft, a conventional craft. It looked more like something that should have been in the, the deep ocean. Yeah. You know, I mean, if it's, luminescent. Yeah, I mean, the, form. The, exactly. It's not something that, I mean, the skeptical say, if it's heading in the direction of Dalton Dal Dal Barracks, it's like, it's like a military helicopter or something. But. Oh, there's no way it was a helicopter. Obviously, that's not a helicopter. No, no. No. It, was, it was a helicopter flying that low, the noise it would make. I see helicopters all the time, and we, we get the, the Chinooks flying across all the time. I mean, I'm familiar with the, the routes of the aeroplanes. Mm -hmm. But this was low altitude. I'm talking 200 foot or so. Right above the house, must have been even about 150 foot above the house tops, house roofs. Well, a helicopter at that altitude would be deafening. Yeah, very yeah. noisy indeed. They um, don't fly that low. They just no. don't fly that low. And also, they have lights on them. This didn't have any lights at all. It was just um, just pure light. Like it was made of energy. It was like it was made of light. Yeah, totally no, made of yeah. light. Yeah, there's no markings mm -hmm. on it. Nothing. That it didn't look like a craft. At first, at first, I thought it was a craft because I'd never even. It wasn't until I began looking into the, the work of Trevor Jones Constable that I even considered that, that there was anything other than craft. But you see, yeah, it's, we assume that it is like some sort of machine that um, yeah. that has biological creatures inside. But that's that's very much an assumption. I mean, yeah. you see an object; it's not necessarily some kind of vehicle. It could be almost anything. Um, um, and of course, this is where we do come onto this because, and this ties in with why sometimes people see things and sometimes people don't. Because, because you you mentioned Trevor James Constable, you managed to get mm. hold of his books. Yeah, and who was he too. exactly? Of Trevor James Constable. Uh, Trevor James Constable was a, was a military historian who wrote um, many um, books on fighter races and planes. But he went into the Mojave Desert in 1958 and started experimenting with infrared film um, with a friend of his, Dr. James Woods. And uh, they began using um, different methods to attract invisible creatures. Uh, well, they were after craft originally. They began doing what's called the star exercise, an exercise by which the whole body energy is, uh, is magnified and um, regular pulses coming from this, um, the theory was that they would um, attract craft. But um, upon getting his first photograph, it wasn't a craft he captured, but a giant amoeba-like invisible UFO. <laughs> right, yeah, so, I mean, this is, this is obviously like we're using descriptive terms here, um, but we're, we're talking about 
basically the difference between UFOs that resemble some kind of solid object in terms of being That's metallic, yeah. Yeah, yeah, something that yeah. is, looks metallic or mechanical, and something that looks biological. Yeah, yeah. And we we're not saying that the that one is a craft and one is a, a an animal. We're just saying this is what they resemble. I think. That's, yeah, that's yeah. I mean, it could be interdimensional craft. I'm yeah. sure that uh, you know, appearing as light. I mean, yeah. interestingly, I've got to mention something about about your experience in 2008. Um, you, this was you had it Christmas Day 2008. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, regular viewers will know this, but um, and I've made a video about this. But just four days later, sorry, three days later, on the 28th of December, uh, this was in early afternoon. I saw something over Oxford, mm. and it was this was something that looked slightly. I think it was circular. It was almost circular, or maybe slightly off circular or spherical, right. and um, it was hanging in the sky overhead. <coughs> it was obviously some considerable size because it was like at a four, you know, thirty odd degree elevation, and a cloud went in front of it. Right. And I was on the phone to my girlfriend at the time, um, and she, and I, I could have stopped and taken a photo of it, but because I had my phone on me, but. Probably it was just it's just a standard normal mobile phone. Probably the quality wouldn't have been very yeah, good, and the object might not even appear. It was quite some distance, around that quarter of the size of the full moon. It's apparent size, right. and I th and I like many people. I thought, what's the point of taking a photo of something that wouldn't come out very well? And people would just say, I faked it anyway. Yeah. Well, that's the problem, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And I mean that, that brings that brings we'll come yeah. onto that subject with you as well because because you're going to get these accusations too. Um, <laughs> but um, carrying on, sorry, we'll carry on with um, what Trevor, because Trevor James Constable wrote a couple of books, didn't he? And you managed to get some old copies of his books. Yeah, they're yeah. not very well known. They're out of print. And um... no, the first book um, was uh, "They Live in the Sky," um, which was released in 1958, and there was his, his first adventures in the Mojave Desert with Dr. James Woods, and um, they, they got quite a few different photographs in those days. Mm. And that was while he was using the star exercise. Mm. But then he started using the cloudbuster. Um, and uh, you know the next ten years' work or so was covered in his next book, which is *The Cosmic Pulse of Life*, mm. which is probably the best, best well-known book by Trevor Jones Constable. But I actually wrote to Trevor because um, I was quite impressed with his book, and I told him I was thinking of starting to take photographs digitally. Um, you know, he encouraged me. He wrote a really nice mm. letter back to me and encouraged me, which was like a you know a red rag to a bull for me. It was mm. like. Yeah. So this is that, the guy. The, this is the guy who yeah. really inspired you. But it wasn't until 2010 mm -hmm. when I actually started going out with an infrared camera. But we had that horrible winter that went on for ages and ages. Yeah, and I remember. That. I think it was about April when I started getting my first proper footage. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I remember. I mean, this is um, something I, rem I um, recall of people talking about this. I mean, this is something that has been discussed on UFO Truth magazine. I'm writing an article on UFO Truth magazine all about this as well, which will be out before this. You see this video. But check that out. Um, get a hold of a copy of that. And subscribe. You read my column every month. But um, this is all lot, got a lot to do with the electromagnetic spectrum because, mm. and we <clears throat> we know very well that occasionally people will see UFOs, and they will not be detectable on other kinds of devices. Like they don't em emit any radio waves or anything like that. Some of them don't give out a radio a radar signal. They don't give a radar um, echo. You know, you don't get a radar contact of them. Um, on the other hand, the other, the it's it's possible the other way around happens as well, and this is mm. where your work I think is very interesting, because um, what we see as light is, is lights that the human eyes can detect, is just a very small set of wavelengths within well, the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah, or well, the visible spectrum, basically. Yeah, and I mean it's the fact our, our the limits of human vision, basically make the world look the way it is. Yeah. For example, if we could see if we could see for instance a higher wavelength for, for instance a shorter wavelength such as X rays, then people would look like translucent bags of bone and you're gonna see people's oh, bones. Yeah, yeah. And houses wouldn't need windows because you can see out. You need to see if you broke a bone though, can you? <laughs> exactly you'd be able to see if you, and things like that. Um so these as uh, Juliana Conforto um who who wrote several really good books, she makes this point. That the fact that the, the, limit, the actual um, parameters of human vision, which is from a short wavelength, from what we call red up to violet, yeah, well, the colours, these yeah. are the wavelengths, yeah. that's all we can see. Now there's some animals that can see ultraviolet, there's some animals that can see infrared, which is the, uh, the wavelengths immediately above and below the visible light, mm. but we can't. No, it's we can't. Yeah. about 400 to nanometers to about 750, yeah. I think. Yeah. You, you might be able to... You may be able to use a, a thermal imager, which you can see infrared yeah. too. I mean, that's, but um, th but it's what we're dealing with here. I think is phenomena um, that actually 
are only detectable outside the limits of human vision. And they seem to be heat based, um, you know, they seem to have their form in, in a plasma type. Well that's interesting because mm. a couple of months ago, this was reported in UFO Truth, um, this was a, well it was, it was actually filmed in 2011 but it was declassified last year. Mm. Uh, in Chile, in South America, the Navy, a Navy helicopter detected an object which um, was, was visible, but it was leaving behind, a, it was like a, a saucer shaped object, I think, and it was trying, right, it left yeah. behind like a chemtrail, like a trail of vapour behind right. it. Right? Yeah. Now, this was very, very tenuous in the visible light spectrum, but the inf this guy had a thermal imager in his, in his helicopter, the pilot was looking at it through a thermal imager, and it was very, it was deep black, opaque. So, which meant it was actually very hot. Right, right. It was actually giving a massive infrared signal, which means a very, very hot object. Right. That's quite something. Um, so we're going to have a look in, in, I'll tell you what, we'll, um, in a moment we'll have a look at the various equipment you use as well, because I want yeah. to see that. Yeah. But, of course, you'll be seeing a lot of photographs in the course of this film. And some sceptics will say, We'll go, it goes back to the rod phenomenon. They'll say, well, these are insects. These are insects captured, and because of digital processing, they look a bit odd. Mm. So how do you answer that? Well, funnily enough, I'm making a video at the moment, um, a YouTube video called um, Rod's Fact or Fiction, and I have actually got some footage of insects, because insects do elongate when mm. they're filmed, and a lot of people have presented these as rods when they're clearly insects, whereas a lot of the stuff I've, that I come forward with it's not stretched, repeated wings. Mm -hmm. um, I've got some great footage that I've been putting together for this video showing insects. Um, mm -hmm. And you can see like up to like half a dozen, well even a dozen wings, you know, repeats of the wings. I've done mm -hmm. that in this book actually, I've showed yeah. the difference between insects. You can see the multiple repeats of wings in here. This is uh, what, uh, now uh, Nick has concluded this page in his book for control purposes. He's actually taken some control pictures of insects to demonstrate that what he is, he is actually recording is different, and you see like this laddering effect of the wings. It's like yeah. um, they, they because they're moving quickly through a digital processing. You get like multiple images. That's due to end the interlaced um, video, but on, on mm. when you're taking photographs, that can also be long exposure times. Yeah, but I'm actually making a video about that at the moment, uh, which I will put on the oh, Quest the Invisibles the QFTI YouTube channel. Well, you go to the link in the description box, ladies and gentlemen. As per her Panwo TV tradition, check out Nick's. YouTube channel because he's got a lot of interesting stuff on there, and um, so that's I think that does you, what you're you, what you're recording does look very very different from from the insects and what's more some of the rod photos I think from, from other people have recorded I think are different from the insects as well. Yes, yeah, so, well this is what I'm trying to put over on this video. Um, most of the rod footage I've seen has been put over on the internet. It's clearly um, you know insects that have been stretched, but some of it isn't. I've captured footage where there's like torpedo like mm -hmm. um, long torpedo like look like creatures with the occasional fins on the side of them. Some of them look like torpedoes or missiles. And they actually they move They move yeah. in a purposeful way. So they're not seeds blown from trees or anything no, like that. No, no, they actually things, move yeah. in a purposeful way. They move way. like torpedoes. I mean, yeah. in some cases, um, there was a case in Albany Airport going back a few years when somebody filmed one of these torpedo-like or missile-like rods. And, um, you know, I think the security at the airport um, picked up on it when some guy said he took a picture and then the FBI ended up getting hold of the footage and mm. take it away for analysis. I do mention that on my website actually, there's some pictures of um, different different things I've caught on my website. There's a section, evidence section on skyfish and it shows various bits and bobs from stretched insects to dome shaped skyfish and then proper fish shaped mm -hmm. um, fish that I've caught in the ultraviolet. Yeah, that's a, I mean it's interesting the way the government always gets involved in these things isn't it? It's, it's interesting the way that the government keeps, whenever, I mean, the, you ask an official government position, they'll, they'll just deny, they'll say it's just nonsense, it's just people making it up, or they're deluded. It's con men and the mentally ill, basically. But funny enough, when people do have UFO encounters, they get a lot of attention from what looks like government forces. And, and we could ask Nick Pope more about that, although he doesn't, he denies that he was involved in this. He says he was just running the UFO desk, but I don't believe him, quite frankly. Well, that's it. Well, you know, it makes you wonder when you know my equipment gets seized when I send it <laughs> off to get it <laughs> turned into infrared. Well, this is um, this is yeah. I mean, I mean, we're going to talk about your equipment in a minute, but I mean, you did have an experience, did you? When you, because one of your cameras took about is it three months it took to get here? Well, I sent, yeah, yeah, but basically, I've been sending my cameras and my camcorders off to a company in America called Max Max. Normally, turnaround time is about two weeks, but this last one I sent over. This is to convert them to convert them to like either full mm. spectrum or infrared, mm. you know. Mm. 
Um, the last lot I sent over, a camcorder as it was, for a full spectrum um, conversion. And after about two or three weeks, it hadn't even arrived. Um, so I started looking into it, and it, I noticed um, at the Kennedy Airport it had been listed as being taken off for inspection. Mm. Um, and I rang the firm, and they said, "No, we definitely haven't got it." And then I was being, then I noticed strange black cars watching me for two months and following me everywhere I went. Um, mm. Very suspicious. That, that is very that yeah. That sort of thing happens to a lot of people, yeah. and it indicates that the government is the government knows about your host. As Admiral Hillencutter, the first head of the CIA, said, "Yeah, you know, we we we." Dismiss these things as nonsense, but the government is in secret is soberly <laughs> concerned in private about the UFO phenomenon. Um, so yeah, this is um, this is a really quite um, this is a very very serious matter. I think it really is. Now, um, if it's okay, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about um, about, for instance, like um, you live in a in the same property as your sister. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. What, what does she think about all this? Um, she's interested. She just look at some of the footage and. Um, I often show the footage. I mean, it's not something she's into. She's not in, going to start taking photos, but um, but now she's quite interested in it, quite intrigued by it actually. It's good that you, it's good that you she is because, I mean, um, I've talked about this before, but my, my dad really, my dad has no interest in this, and my brother thinks I'm crazy, and my <laughs> yeah. daughter does. Well, my daughter's a bit more open-minded now. So I used to be get it, I used to get it from three generations now. But look, Louise, my daughter's a bit more open-minded now, which is something. But it's good when your your family's a bit sort of more. Um, is on your side. At least, at least they're not dismissing it. Do you know what I mean? That's no, I mean. that's it. Yeah, no. I mean, it was, it was good getting the book out as well. I mean, you know, obviously, I, I Trevor Jones Constable's um, publisher decided he wanted to put the book out, which was great for me as well. Mm. I mean, he took it seriously enough, and a lot of other people have, you know. So good. Yeah. Now you became very, you became very um, focused on this. I mean, it's, it's fair to say. I mean, you, in your book, you describe how this basically became your life's work. Oh, it still is. It still yeah. is. Yeah. I mean. And you needed to. Some people might call it an obsession, but um, you know, when you're seeing a UFO like I have it, it just changes your whole life. It's, mm. It just changes it. You just think, oh my god, it's true, it's true, and you just want to capture more footage, you know. Mm. Yeah, I mean the, of course it's the, the the, derog the derogatory kind of term for this is an obsession, and I'm not saying that as a criticism because I'm the same as you. <laughs> yeah. I really am. Yeah. And because um, I've been accused of having an obsession, and I suppose it is, and. But it's something that I'm very focused on, and because I've I've seen these things, yeah. I, I know they exist. <clears throat> I'm incredibly interested in them. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you did say at one point you were you felt you were losing your grip on reality. You were very focused. You felt you were losing your grip well, on. Well, when you, you had to take time out, you went and had some gardening jobs. And things. when you're going out for six hours a day filming with two or three cameras every single day for nearly three years. Mm -hmm. And all you're doing is sitting there looking back at footage, you know, 50 frames a second, and you're looking through hundreds of thousands of frames just to get something that appears on one frame. Um, you know, it, and you're very, very isolated, you know. I mean, I, I stopped seeing a lot of my friends and they've all drifted off. I, I just became totally obsessed with it. But, you know, I want answers. I want to know what's going on. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'd say that is dedication. I mean, I think that's a good thing, you see, because you, mm. you need to be dedicated to this. And I mean, I, yeah. and it is, it, it is something that's a bit antisocial, quite frankly, to, <laughs> if you, if within the mainstream world. And so this is inevitable. But I've been in the same position as you. I really have. And like you, I, I've had to, I've had to take a step back at times. Oh gosh, gotcha, yeah. Because yeah, you mentioned you once took like some time off. And, yeah, um, in the book, I yeah, I'm yeah. Like a chapter back to normality. Mm -hmm. um, I went away with my sister um, and my niece for a little bit. Um, mm. for a holiday just to get rid of it but you know you went to Sussex you said yeah right? Sussex yeah but I ended up taking the infrared camera <laughs> no, you can't <laughs> they can't ask too much for you one step at a time Nick. No, one step at a no. time yeah oh, that's um, that's quite something now um, I want to come up to something else now um, this is one of the most annoying things but you've got the Brian Cox treatment as well oh right? yes that's right yeah and um, yeah well there's actually a video on that of that on the Quest for Invisible's YouTube channel mm -hmm. um, I mean the whole radio um, one interviews on well Radio Oxford sorry not Radio mm. Radio Oxford interviews on there. Um, there is a segment where Brian Cox made a few comments. Uh. Mm. <laughs> it's just, this is typical. I mean this is BBC Radio Oxford, second of May, twenty thirteen, and it's on the channel. You can listen to it. But basically, uh, the, <laughs> this presenter here, Malcolm Boyden, is uh, well, he first he has Cox on before he has you on. Yeah, I'm lucky yeah. to give, but um, <coughs> it's, um, what do you think of my guest, Archer Eleven o'clock? His name is Nick, and he's a UFO photographer. He's discovered sea creatures, well, that's, as you say later on, that's not what you discovered, that are invisible to the naked eye, flying over Abingdon. I would question him seriously over that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he goes on, and Cox is being Cox. Um, I won't read out the whole thing, but he reckons it's, oh, 
It will be one of the greatest scientific discoveries of all time. Yeah. But I mean, he's the one who dismisses it. He calls us names. He calls us knobbers. <laughs> yeah. This is one of his, these derogatory terms from Oldham, apparently, where he comes from. But, um, yeah, it's, he, Cox has been presented with this evidence and he's ignored it. Well, I'd like to send him a book, but you can't get anywhere near him. That's the problem. Oh, well, um, he's... I'll wait till he appears somewhere, and I'll slip mm. on the skin one out of him. Or a friend of mine emailed him some information, yeah. and he tweeted, A notice to nutters. And please don't use my private emails to send me nonsense. I don't respect your opinions, and I will call you names, <laughs> he said. So that's his attitude, basically. So I think he's a bit of a lost cause, he's quite frankly. He's the party line, the thing. Yep. Is. It is a complete... A lot of things he can't actually say, even yep. if he agrees with them, I imagine. It's, it's a good. complete lost cause. Yeah. But so the term sea creatures was not actually a quote from you. No, it wasn't actually. No, re I, I think the reason they use it is because some of the terminology... Well, the jellyfish. Yeah. I actually caught, what, a, uh, I caught a jellyfish. Well, it looked very much like a jellyfish, which was travelling in tentacles first. Mm. Um, it's the terminology that Nick uses to describe these, these, well, you these have objects. To, you have to. Sometimes resemble... I mean, this is only what they look like, but he uses words like skyfish, jellyfish, things like that. And they, these, these are not what they are. He's this not, is it. I mean, it's yeah. not a clear picture of it, but you, there is, you can see these yeah. on some of the videos. But um, We'll insert this into the film. We'll insert, we'll insert it into the film so you can actually see it. But, you see, the thing about it is, um, this is just, just, these are descriptive terms that Nick is using... I'm just going to change the film chip, but we're going to continue, but because um, we're running out of film, and I've got another. Luckily, I've got some more. But um, these are descriptive terms that Nick is using to describe the, the, what they appear to, what they resemble. These yeah. are just these are metaphors. He's not saying they're sea creatures in the sky, which would be which would be contradictory, wouldn't it? You don't get sea creatures in the sky. Well, that's right. Know. Yeah. I mean, I've named a few of the other ones like plasmatic gliders and spinning jennies. I've given some of them names just for my, you know, just for myself mm. to to refer to them as something. This is merely this is merely for descriptive purposes, and it's for, it's perfectly scientific to use these kinds of metaphors. Dr. Judy Wood does the same thing. She talks about wheat checks, and mm -hmm. she talks about well, Cheetos and things like that. She doesn't mean, they mean this literally, but of course, the sceptical media, including Ray BBC, which is the, the BBC, which is what Cox was on, and they had Nick on. Yeah, the sceptical right. media will always they will always very intellectually dishonestly smear us by trying to say, oh look. He's talking about fish in the sky and things like that. You know, what a knobber. So it's important not to to, uh, to take any notice of that. Anyway, let's, I'm just going to change the film chip over and then we should continue. Okey doke. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Um, and um, so this is quite something. Now, you, you have um, some techniques for people who are new to this. And in a minute, we'll go for your equipment and we will we'll make do a demonstration. But you have, um, you talk about... Um, Staring at the sky, you know, staring at blue sky itself can actually yeah. adjust your vision. Yeah, yeah. There's a technique that Trevor Jones Constable um, discovered when he was actually because um, he was he was actually in the, the Merchant Marine for many years, and he used to be looking for ships coming in the in the distance, and he'd be looking like that. And one of the old boys said to him, you know, just relax your eyes, and your eyes will find it. They'll see anything. So mm. it's almost like that. You look into the sky, and rather than sort of looking straight at the sky. You relax your eyes totally, and after a while, it almost goes into like um, negative, and you can actually see flashes of light where these things are. So obviously, I take pictures in that direction, but I do obviously I use um, a Geiger counter quite a lot as well now, because a Geiger counter seems to indicate um, manifestations in the invisible. Mm. Um, so these actually these actually give off like um, like radioactive particles. Well, they seem to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure where you know. Because a lot of people who have encounters end up with. I mean, Larry Warren and uh, um, John Burroughs, these, these are of the Red Ocean Forest incident, these are perfect examples. Mm, mm, mm. People who have these close encounters and they end up with various health, prob health problems that can be associated with exposure to so radiation. Yeah, yeah, well, radiation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I know that um, Larry, of course, he worked on a, on a base where there were nuclear weapons, but, <laughs> yeah. but of course, these were well shielded. I mean, there's, there's no, there's no radio, there's no, uh, there was no leakage or anything from these weapons. So, the, the his his health problems for his eyes and his skin, I think, come from his exposure to this particular. I'm not, su I'm not surprising. I'm not, you know, yeah. not surprising. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. And um, so that's um, that's that's quite something. So using the guy counters is important. Now, um, you've had some pretty alarming experiences as well, even up to last night. But first of all, you mentioned, for instance, you've had um, a, you've had a break in here. Into this, in this house. Yeah, yeah, well, well, yeah, but it wasn't actually into the house. It was either into this room. Uh, Mike, it was around the time when I was being watched, actually. 
But um, my camcorder went missing. Um, it just just the camcorder and nothing else. Um, you know, and then we all started having weird knocks now and then. And knocks would happen on the doors, and the doors would ring at two or three in the morning. And there's no way anyone can even get in our property. Um, things started disappearing. Keys started disappearing, and mm -hmm. you know the dogs started reacting and. So I had a lot of strange things happening, but you know, as I said to you earlier, I think when you start opening yourself up to the invisible, um, it starts opening itself up to you. Yeah, and this is um, yeah. familiar. People who are familiar with Anne Andrews and her books, you know, these um, will know this. I mean, that the that she's she and her family experience something similar. They were. I mean, I've I've actually been. I actually stayed with them once, and weird things were happening. Like lights would switch on by yeah, themselves. Yeah, and that's like a that. common one. Yeah. You know, or think, but things. Just things disappearing, things going missing, doorbells ringing, phones ringing, there's no yeah, one there. Yeah. This is all <clears throat> part of the syndrome, which means contact with... Well, they with seem to be able to manipulate um, electric things that are electric. Yeah, that's phones. I mean, just, you know, when my mum died, me and my sister went back to her flat, and a friend of ours came round, and I was just saying to my sister, I wonder where mum is, you know, she, she just died, and all of a sudden my friend's phone flashed, and a message appeared on the front of his phone, not on the inbox, but on the front of his phone, it said, um, just want you to know that when you die, you're not really dead. I'm still here with you. <laughs> that was on. That was on the phone. That actually appeared that's on amazing, front of my yeah. friend's phone. Wow. Not that's on my phone, yeah. you know, but you know, that's um, an incredible thing to, to experience. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. obviously, with psychical research, this is uh, electronics. Is often how spirits contact people. Um, EVP and things like that. We've we discussed that before. But this is a crossover between the abduction and UFO and alien contact field and mm -hmm. psychical research because there is a, there is an overlap between those things. <laughs> So you've had um, so you've had breaking. You say people in dark coloured cars were following you around. Again, this is a bit of a cliche, but it does happen. Yeah, it did happen. Yeah, mm. I walked up the shops and I saw one of them, um, a man and a woman in a car. This is around the time when my um, new camcorder had been seized and not sent on for the conversion. They were obviously um, looking into me for some reason. I think you know the American intelligence services must have said, "Oh, look into this guy," and then got mm. British was looking after me. But I walked past <laughs> the car and I saw a guy slip a walkie-talkie down the side. And uh, he turned to the woman and he said, oh, that's the male we're interested mm. in. Alternatively, I mean... You know, it went on for two months. Altern yeah, they could be intelligence agents, but alternatively they could be something connected to the extraterrestrial phenomena itself. Nick Redfern, people like Joe, yeah. Nick Redfern have talked about <coughs> this a lot. And um, you know, there's um, the guy who wrote The Mothman Prophecies. Um, he he what's it? I've just, I've just, yeah, I watched something about him the other day. Yeah, actually, I've, um, John Keel. John Keel. I couldn't yeah, remember his yeah, name yeah, from all this. Yeah. I love all the names to forget, but, I couldn't. but um, they themselves have talked about the Men in Black phenomenon and how it may they may actually be connected to the extraterrestrial phenomenon itself. I mean, the thing about it is, if you and also whatever it is, it's clear they wanted them to know they were watching you, because if they didn't want if they didn't want to know. If they didn't want you to know they were following around, you wouldn't know. I mean, well, it's, uh, they're the thing, was, the thing was, for two months, um, they were watching me, and then all of a sudden my camcorder came back, and then, every time I went on the bus with my sister, or even by myself, the bus would mysteriously, mysteriously stop one stop down, and these two guys would get on. Yeah. They were like 60-year-old, like military sort of aircoats, but they were like rips in the jeans. They were always like trying to be something they weren't. And they just blatantly stood there looking at me. They mm. didn't even pay for a ticket. They'd use a... They just show a pass of some sort, and they just stand there looking at me and my sister. And my sister, she's not really that observant when it comes to things like the police. She doesn't take any notes, but she said, you know, those guys are looking at you and looking at me. Mm -hmm. And they, they followed me around for quite a while. But, you know, I had a good mind to send a copy of my book to the FBI or to the CIA. So, <laughs> you know, or the MI5 even. So, you know, you don't need to look at me anymore. This is where I'm at. Yeah, they, they want, obviously, it's, it's yeah. intended to intimidate you. I mean, yeah. I knew a lady who's um, who actually had a boyfriend actually was a policeman and um, they were dating for a while and um, he one day he they was talking and said did anyone do you know someone following you last night and she said no yeah. no no one followed when he, she was going home she got like several buses and things like that and she got a train and she said, oh oh the guys down the station where they would we, we did a little practice surveillance operation on you oh, she said, what she said, well, it's okay, isn't it? We weren't there. It was just it was just for practice. We were just training some new guys, so we trained them in surveillance so they followed you home. And she was like, What? No, no, it's alright, we just it was just we're just doing it for practice. We weren't gonna we weren't gonna do anything to you, we weren't gonna arrest you or anything. It's just this is how we do it. We just pick on normally we pick on a random stranger and, and tell the guys to follow like, them. Like Menendez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well yeah, but they, 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 he was different. <laughs> but um we decided to use uh, I I recommended you. 
she was a bit put out by that. But the, the point was, yeah. the point is that she never. This, they did this several times before he actually confessed to her, and <laughs> not once did she ever spot anyone following her. So, so the intelligence right. services and the police and the intelligence services, if they want to follow you around, they don't want you to know. You won't know. I mean, they'll, they'll use things like seats, you know, covert cameras and things like that. You just won't know. I'm very paranoid, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I, you realise you're being followed around, it yeah. means they want you to well, see. Well, some them. of the neighbours told me there were some suspicious black cars, and I thought, mm -hmm. hang on a minute, they've seen my goods. It must be something to do with that. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. and the only photograph they would have had from me would have been from my old website, which is me using a cloudbuster. You know, and a cloudbuster looks like a missile launcher or something. It was. We take. <laughs> well, it looks. It does. I see. This is a bit alarming. A, a guy with a helicopter, a police helicopter flying over, might take a look at that. I've had that. <laughs> we'll be showing. We'll be showing you that in a minute. Actually. Drones coming over. I've had, I've had a lot of. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've scaled my cloudbuster down. I used to have a really big one with pipes and everything, and a lot more metal pipes in mm. it and um, I, I've scaled it down because um, I kept getting problems with the police helicopter mm. whether or not they were watching me or what but I've had quite a few drones coming over recently which is right. a bit worrying mm. um, I bet yeah that's but I mean this is um, this is another common thing for people who get involved in this subject especially yeah. people who've actually had contact and a couple of other alarming things have happened to you now um, you were taking a walk in a place I'm familiar with because it's in Oxford City it's, it's called Lye mm. Valley mm. and it's like a nature reserve in the heart of Oxford yeah and it's actually a it's a little valley that runs down right through the heart of a residential area. So, so there's, there's, you don't have to go far. There's the Churchill Hospital on one side. There's Wood Farm State on the other. Yeah, there's, there's a golf course golf at the course, end of it. The golf course. Right, but, but if you're, when you're actually in the middle of it, it, looks, it feels like you're, no, you're in the middle of nowhere because you can't see anything. Cause it's the banks go up either. Yeah, yeah, steep sides, there's a little yeah. stream that runs down the middle of it and there's, yeah. it's all grass and there's greenery and there's trees and you can't see a damn thing. Yeah, it's like being yeah, in the middle of nowhere. That's, that's right. And I've walked down there a lot, mostly in daylight, I should point out, because yeah. it is really spooky at night, but you actually did walk down there at night. Yeah. Um, and uh, what happened? Well, yeah, I, well, I used to go there at night. I'm a musician um, and when I was getting my last band together, um, this is going back about 10 years, I used to walk down, get a bus down to my friend's house in Cowley, but I was running late, so I thought I might as well take the shortcut, because it, it used to live in Marsh Road, and it actually comes right out near Marsh Road. Mm. Um, and it was just getting dark, um, it wasn't sort of dark above me, but it was dark towards Cowley, so I thought oh, I'll give it a try, but as I got further down, it just got dark, and um, it got really creepy, and I started walking into the heart of, um, of the live alley, and all of a sudden I heard something about 20 yards to my left, which probably upon the bank, walking with me so I stopped and I and another couple of footsteps went so I started walking a bit faster and that walked a bit faster so I started half running then I just stopped really sudden and just carried on running for a little bit and then I went like that and jumped and stopped again and this thing obviously took two more steps and then it went like that and I'll tell you what I, I turned around and I ran back because I knew for a while that um, the path I was on was going to be meeting the path that this thing was on um, and it scared the life out of me. It was like fight or flight. That's and I ran. I ran like hell. It scared the life out of me. Mm -hmm. I've never been back again since. But I do plan to go down there again soon and have a look into it. But um, yeah, the beast of Live Alley. Oh, um, well, now, if Charmaine Fraser and, or Deborah Hatswell, if you're watching this, you're probably thinking about the Bigfoot thing. But but I mean, I know that I take the Bigfoot thing seriously. But this is obviously something that was. This is this is something that Bigfoot doesn't do follow people around and try to intimidate them. But it in disappeared, it wasn't, it wasn't on my track before and it wasn't in front. So I don't know how the yeah. hell it suddenly appeared to the left of me, unless it was an interdimensional creature which suddenly appeared. But it could be, you see, that's it. But it, it sounded yeah. like a, I saw a program about a werewolf encounter and they, they put a snarl sound, you know, for the what, what sound the werewolf made. And when I heard that, it, it reminded me, it took me straight back to this night. And it still makes the hair stand up on the back of my, you know, on the back of my neck now. Um, I don't know if anybody else has had an experience down there because it's such a small place. I mean, it's not. It's only like a mini walk. I mean, it, you know, you're on the golf course within about 15, 20 minutes. Sure, yeah, it's, it's not. But so isolated when you're down there by yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I t sometimes take shortcuts through this. Usually, when I'm on my way back from, or back, or back from a late shift or something like that. Um, if I've been at the mm -hmm. social club or something, and it's it is a quick short route, but I, I've only done it a couple of times now. It does have a horrible atmosphere yeah. at night time when you're out on your own down there. It really does. Yeah. You know. So that's something <coughs> scary. Now, another experience is one that we're actually filming. I think we're all filming on the 6th of October. This is actually something that happened last night. Right. And in, and so you actually had a, something in this room. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. All, all of a sudden, um, one of my dogs, Lucy, who was up in my room, she started snarling and looking at something in the corner of the room. and. Um, I got this really sinking, horrible feeling, and I could see a haze of something. It almost looked like a humanoid form in the corner. 
got me picked up my camera, my infrared camera, which I've had now for eight years. Um, it's a Canon G10, which has been made into an infrared camera. Turned it on, went to take the photo, and it just went blank. It just wouldn't take photos. The whole screen went black, and it's never done that in eight years. And now it won't work at all. And at the same time, my the, the Geiger counter went off, a huge hit on the Geiger counter. And at the same time, my stereo of ten years just packed up, just went haywire and packed up. So now I've got no stereo, and um, and I use the stereo to put my um, you know, to put my computer through so I can play music. So mm. I've lost that, and I've lost my um, my digital camera. I um, mean, obviously, mm. I will get it repaired if I can. But um, it was almost like a burst of energy it seemed to affect mm. the camera and the Geiger counter and my stereo. So it's, it seems to have um, targeted the, the things you need to do your work. Yeah, it seems to have targeted those very things. Yeah, well, this is the thing. Yeah, I mean, mm. a lot of this started when I began getting those images in the greenhouse. Um, mm. The four images I caught in the greenhouse, which was like a ghostly Napoleonic sort of guy, um, who I thought was standing outside the greenhouse until I took the next photo and I realised that it was. Mm. It seemed to be sort of like in the glass, not behind the glass, but kind of in it. Um, I caught an ET like. Um, I can describe ET like. We'll be taking entity. a look at these. We'll take a look at these pictures yeah. in a minute because I want you. I want maybe you'll take me through a few of these pictures in a moment. Yeah. But um, yeah, so. that's a pretty scary thing that happened last night. Um, definitely. Um, and that was only just last night, just before. I mean, I'm in this room now and everything looks fairly normal. Yeah. But yeah, um, yeah, that's it. less than twelve hours ago or so, there was this this particular. Event, which is pretty scary stuff there, Nick, definitely. But well, this is when the door starts knocking mm. at three o'clock in the morning, you hear footsteps coming up the mm. stairs, you know that no one else can get in, and my sister's in the other main house asleep. So it's not someone physical, but I mean, I've had a, a friend who died recently. I mean, I mean, it could be him for all I know, but um, I wasn't so scared of the knocks and stuff, but when mm. I started getting these images in the greenhouse, they were quite freaky. And of course, mm. I caught a few different entities as well. I mean, all this can be seen on the Question Visible's website. Uh, um, Question link visibles. Link in the description box, yeah. Check yeah, the link so. in the description box, ladies and gentlemen, definitely. Right, so um what we'll do now, um that's really um obviously like you're you're going through a difficult a difficult um a difficult experience with this with this because of you what you're doing. Yeah. And this is again again I sympathise with that. I'm sorry you you're going through with this, but everyone who works hard to get this kind of evidence has this kind of harassment. I myself have had problems, like I said you know, to do with my employment and things like that, and everyone in some way or another gets has problems, and um, the reason for that is well, I think it's because we're getting too close to the truth. Quite frankly, that's what I think is doing. That's why it's happening, and whoever Definitely. is behind this, whether it's you know, I think there are both government a government actors, and also part of the extraterrestrial phenomena itself. That mm, definitely is discouraging people to put it mildly from looking into this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm. Well, th well, it's really good talking to you, Nick. And um, let's yeah, have a look at some of your equipment. Let's have a look at some of your equipment now. Yeah, yeah. Show how serious Nick is. He has this thing in his room, and I don't know, Nick. Uh, don't you think you should be making this out of mashed potato? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, Nick, this is the first piece of equipment we're going to look at, and this is um, your yeah, this recorder. Is, yeah, this is um, Sony HDR PJ620, which is a high definition. Um, I can actually record at 50 frames um, per second on this. And it's, um, I sent this away for conversion, so it's actually full spectrum. And I've got a selection of um, filters here. Um, so basically, I've got this um, Exynot UVR, which is equivalent, it's very similar to the 18A, which was used by Trevor James Constable. And um, it's predominantly an ultraviolet filter, but it lets passes quite an amount of infrared as well, so you're getting infrared and ultraviolet. Mm. So you attach this to the lens? Yeah, it's a simple screw sort of thing to the lens. And um, this actually changes the, the way it's actually, like you say, yeah, because this camera, changes what yeah. part of the electromagnetic spectrum it can actually Yeah, well, this at the moment it can see infrared, ultraviolet and, mm. um, and visible light. So when you put this on, it basically gets rid of the visible light and it lets through um, the both invisible ends, the infrared and the ultraviolet. Mm. Which is quite good. Um, useful. So I use that one there, and I've also I've also got another one here, which is um, this is just a pure infrared one, which is 715 nanometers. So it cuts most of the visible lights. It cuts out um, ultraviolet and most of the um, visible light, apart from a small amount of red, which occurs just before the infrared. Um, so that's just like a pure infrared image. And then I've got another another filter here, which is. Um, which is um, a 330 nanometer ultraviolet filter. Now this cuts out all visible light and um, infrared. So basically, you just get a pure ultraviolet mm. 
thing with that. And this is what I use for a lot of the stuff that's in the book, for the sky fish and various things that are in the book, in the ultraviolet section. Yeah. Um, so I can basically shoot in ultraviolet, um, infrared, or a mixture of ultraviolet and infrared, or I can use no filter at all and film infrared, ultraviolet and visible light. But sometimes the visible light sort of domineers the scene, so I think it's best sometimes to get rid of the visible light and mm. either film infrared or inf or ultraviolet or infrared and ultraviolet together. Mm. Um, so you can basically you got you got the means of eliminating certain parts of the elect yeah. electromagnetic spectrum and um, adding other bits which you wouldn't normally be able to see. For instance, this particular this particular camera I'm using now just records visible light. Just that's right. You yeah. see basically through, through this lens what you see with your eyes. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. yeah. But um, that's that's interesting. Now you've got a couple of other things as well that we're going to look at. Now this is um, let's have a look at this um, particular one because this, this this is the one we were talking about. Yeah, when, this is about my, what happened last night to this. This is my infrared camera. Now you, I mean basically you normally look through there and it will give you the view in infrared. Mm. But as I went as I saw this. Um, thing that happened last night, this manifestation, I pointed it round like that to see what I could see in infrared, but it just went completely blank. And when I tried to take a picture, it, it clicked. Hmm. Nothing came out at all, no picture, nothing. Um, so nothing appears on the viewfinder? Nothing at all, no. And no. nothing's actually taken? No, Even no. though the flash still works? Yeah, nothing's the taken lens at all. Nothing. Yeah. Oh, right. I've had that eight years, I've taken some of my best footage with this. Um, I've taken movie hmm. mode footage and and footage, um, you know, photographs, and a lot mm. of that appears in my book in the infrared section, mm. in my book Quest for the Invisibles. And it just happened to break down when yeah. this big humanoid mist-shaped object appeared yeah, last night. Yeah, yeah, and my stereo. My stereo started going completely oh, crazy. Um, every button was coming on, the volume was going on, then the volume went off, and then now it doesn't work at all. <laughs> so, oh, pretty yeah. sod's law. But I've got this brand new um, camcorder, which I can now use, and I've also got um, mm. this bit of kit over here, which is... Uh, Oh right, yeah, this is, uh, this, is a... this is a CCTV <laughs> camera, which has got oh, like right. a, a 50 metre um, infrared illumination beam. Brilliant. Um, the reason it's strapped to a bit of... Um, you look mean when you're holding that, you really do. <laughs> it's a good weapon. I actually put yeah. this out the window. Um, I put cushions on it and hold this end down, but I put it out the window and I basically film above the trees and I also film with the camcorder. So I've got, it's being filmed in infrared and um, whatever I'm using on the camcorder. Right. Um, infrared or ultraviolet so yeah and originally I would film with that camera as well in movie mode footage so I'd have three cameras filming but obviously mm. I can't do that now yeah so well, that's a useful that's a good uh, use of a CCTV uh, camera there yeah mm. that's right and also I've got, um, got a Geiger counter well oh, radiation obviously. detector right this this detects um, particle basically radioactive particles yeah um, so this is gives for instance from radioactive decay which um, things like that so it picks off it, it, it picks up the various um, types of particles that come off from radioactive decay from the from the atoms. That's from right. The, from yeah, the nucleus. Yeah. Yes, that's right. From yeah. the decaying nucleus. And you can put a threshold, a set of threshold for an alarm on here. As you can see, it's normally 0 0.06, and it sometimes will go up to sort of 0 0.9, sometimes up to 1, um, 0 0.12, but it never really goes above that. What um, units are these? Um, these are micro sieverts. Right. So what I do, I set it for 0 0.2, which is it very rarely goes up to that, but you'll get sudden spikes of 0 0.20 or more. And these, this isn't background in, um, radiation, this is due to um, invisible manifestations, mm. sometimes craft or beings mm. or... I mean, this mm. is going off um, in the greenhouse, which is why I took the photographs of the greenhouse windows and ended up catching the entities. Mm. Well, as we were saying, you know, the, the, actual, um, the actual entities and the various craft, they actually, and we, as we were saying, a lot of people have close encounters suffer from um, people, you know, symptoms of being exposed to high levels of radiation and um, it appears that these things often do emit very high levels of, of radioactivity. They're very often, <coughs> yeah, yeah, that's the thing, yeah. yeah. I find it's a very effective tool. I mean, I before that broke, I, what I do is I go out into the garden or even when I'm walking the dogs, carry this in one hand and then carry the camera and the minute it went off I would just then take photographs in the general mm. direction. So this is um, a good indicator that something's happening? Definitely, definitely, yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. So even if you can't see anything, no. you still take the photographs in the infrared? Yeah, well very often the dogs will stop and then this will go off. It's almost like the dogs have sensed something and then this will go off. Mm. But there's quite a few pictures I've got on my website. There's some nighttime manifestations which I've taken in the garden using the infrared camera. And they're all, all taken as a result of this. Um, most of the footage on my website, which is nighttime footage, was taken um, as a result of um, high Geiger counter readings. And that's the only reason I actually took the photographs. And so a lot of the photographs were taken in complete darkness, no flash. Um, and these beings, a lot of them seem to be self-illuminated or self-illumined as the 
correct mm. terminology is, but um, some of them rely on a flash. Yeah. And even a standard flash is enough to actually light them up and make them appear in the infrared. Yeah. Well, it's just, now, I mean, all you viewers, Panmo TV viewers, and now you want to see some of these pictures now, don't you? I think they want to see some pictures. So shall we, shall we show them some pictures, Nick? Yeah. Okay. Right, we've come outside now, and we're here with Nick in his garden. And the first thing I'm going to show you, if I just get a good shot of this, is the cloud buster. It's a very minimal version. Uh -huh. I'm just going to put the night light on, just a sec, yeah. Due but to the helicopters and um, drone mm. vessels I've been having. Um, right. So this is a scaled down version, just basically straight, three pipes straight into the, yeah. into the water. So this is just with these metal, metal pipes. The way Reich actually designed them. Yeah, they're metal. Um, and there's some groundwater there. It's covered full of water, yeah. 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 Now, well, uh, this is a uh, this is like a very very simple device. But when Wilhelm Reich was using it, yeah, if you go near yeah. this with a compass, it will spin the compass <coughs> back round mm. the opposite way. It's so magnetised, mm. even though they weren't magnetised when I started using mm. them. But basically, this 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 attracts. Um, I aim it to a certain area like that, and then what I generally do is keep the guide counter here, and then I will set this up on a tripod, and I'll I'll film straight into the area because a lot of the things that come uh, are actually invisible. Yeah. Um, so, so it's a matter of me normally just sitting out here with it, getting the Geiger counter on, and I, I, I do some summoning sometimes where I'll just stare into the sky and ask these things to come, and then within 10, 15 minutes they'll often appear as bright lights and they'll come down, they look like stars sometimes, and they'll come mm. down and move above the garden and I flash the lights to them and they actually flash back to me. Yeah. Oh, um, right. so, so that's what I generally do, but um, obviously it takes a while, yeah. you know. This camera has a basic, like, it does have a thermal imager on it, see? Yeah, yeah but it's actually, actually like a radiated thermal here. imaging. Yes. Yeah. You can see the little red light there. That's uh, basically, yeah. So generally, I kind of come forward out of the way of the lights and I'm filming straight up into the sky, but obviously mm. these lights are affecting me at the moment because normally yeah. I do it around the other side, but... Yeah. Um, so it's just a matter of, like, waiting to see something up there. The Geiger counter will detect anything that's above the trees and high mm. in the air. You get sudden hits. But normally I'll have this set up on a, on a, a tripod permanently looking up there. Mm. I'll also have the CCTV one out the window looking up there in infrared. Um, and then I'll use my camera, but of course the camera's not working at the moment, oh, and I'll, yeah. I'll rapidly take photographs. Um, but this, I generally do this on a warm day. Um, I block the sun beyond the tree so that anything across the top helps to get illuminated anyway. Mm. And then I just basically just film straight into the sky. Mm. Um, and I stare into that position in the sky as well, where the cloudbuster's aiming. Mm. And um, generally, you know, Within 15 minutes of asking, you'll get things appearing. Um, so this is a different kind of sky watching. This is sky watching you can actually do in daylight. Um, so yeah, uh, daylight or evening. But I mean, mm. I prefer to do it in the daytime to be quite honest, mm. because these things will come over um, and they'll just drift right over. Often they look like balloons or even paper bags, but you'll see them come down from on high and they'll come right above the house and they'll gradually, they'll, if you flash them um, with a mirror in the daytime, they'll flash back to you. All oh, right. And, then, and then they'll just sort of drift off across and, um, and off they go. It's a bit like Dr. Stephen Greer's protocols, was it the, uh, the, the CE5 protocols, as he calls them? Yeah, Except yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're not charging you money. <laughs> but at we're charging you £5,000. At night time, you'll see star-like shapes come out of the sky, and they'll come above the house, and they'll basically be really in, in, you know, intense, and then they'll, mm. they'll move across the sky, and you, you zoom in on them. Um, I've done that on a couple of things. But I've only recently started doing it at night. Mm. Um, I'm mainly a daytime person. I normally film... Like everything that I capture in the ultraviolet, um, what I generally do is block the sun behind a roof. Um, not this one so much because the trees are here. And then I film into the edge of the roof. So I'm basically focused on the edge of the roof and then sort of beyond it. So anything moving across, like the jellyfish, I filmed above that roof there. I mm. zoomed into the top of the roof like that. Yeah. And obviously the sun's blocked behind and the jellyfish. Mm. Came straight across the top. Um, yeah, and that dorm, so. that dormer window where that, that's where you put the CCTV yeah, yeah, I put it thing. Yeah, aiming straight up in yeah. the air, exactly where the cloudbuster's aiming. Um, obviously, I do this in the daytime mainly. And I'll use the Geiger counter as well to give me an indication of anything that's coming invisible. Because sometimes you'll see them mm. in the visible, but very often they'll come in the invisible. And you won't realise what you've caught till you actually um, look back at the footage. Yeah. But you will get an indication very often on these. Not all the time, it depends. Um, but you know, I've caught quite a few craft-like, um, and there's pictures in my book of craft-like um, objects, and some of them morph before your very eyes. They, they look like one thing one minute, and they change and look totally different the other. Yeah. So it's always hard it. to know. Um, yeah. but, but I spent three or four hours doing this. You know, I'll do certain movements with the cloudbuster um, across the sky and back again and stuff. And you know, it does attract things. I used to take a couple of hundred photographs, and you guarantee you'll catch something most of the time. Mm. So you have, a, I mean, we've you've just had a look at some of the uh, the videos. I mean, there's an awful lot more video and footage and photographs we could show you. So you have a high success rate in what you do. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I've been doing it, mind you, for like eight years. I mean, um, the pictures that you see in the book um, is a combination of five years of work in the infrared and the ultraviolet, and that's the best of um, what I've mm. captured. I've captured hundreds of things, but they're often too small or perhaps a bit blurry, you know, um, and it's no good, really. You don't mm. want to, you know, having to enlarge things all the time because they lose quality, especially when you try and print them in a book. Yeah, that's fair um, enough, yeah. So, yeah. So. But this is interesting. Well, what we'll do, maybe we'll come back, in, come back another time. Yeah. And we'll actually, I'll, I'll, we'll watch you at work and maybe I can be a, and watch, and, well, maybe I can be here and capture it on her panel TV yeah. when you capture something. It'd be yeah, really, well, that'd really be good. good. Yeah, if we can do some summoning, in, you'll definitely be able to zoom in. I have problems with this because I, I can't film normal video. Mm. And what happens is when something that comes in the air that's red or orange, I see it as white on this because it mm. doesn't see normal colour. Yeah. Um, and the problem is, um, against the sky, you won't see it. Whereas with a, with a normal camcorder, you'll see a bright red object moving across the sky or orange. But you won't see that on this. It just appears white. Right. Um, so, I mean, I could get... I might send off a filter on this to mm. make it as a normal camcorder just for visible stuff. Our weather, does, does the weather matter? Are there certain weather conditions that are better than others? I always, yeah, I, I always do it when there's a pure blue sky or at least a big patch of blue sky. Um, a nice sunny day. That's the important thing. Mm. For the sky fish, what I normally do is um, I go right back to the back of the garden and I basically film them above this huge tree. I wait till the sun goes behind the tree. Obviously, when it's in leaf, it blocks the sun out. And then I aim straight up at the top of the tree and anything coming in line with the cloudbuster that goes across the top of the tree will be lit up by the sun mm. um, and therefore becomes visible um, to the infrared. Right. OK. Well, Nick, Nick, thanks very much for showing me this. Oh, much okay. appreciated. Anytime. I okay. camcorder um, footage which has been taken. Um, right. Um, let me just get it secured for you. This is um, this is some video that um, you're, what you're looking at now is some video that Nick has shot, which he's very kindly given me permission to include in this video. Yes. And um, and so this is uh, this is. This uh, is showing you some of it. It's, it's um, this is all ultraviolet footage. Mm -hmm. It's taken um, using um. The camcorder. Okay. It shows you different speeds of it going. Okay. Well, you better watch it. Oh, okay, so I'll put... Hang on, do you want to... Okay. Okay, I'll pause it so you can actually watch okay, it. Um, thanks. Right, this is the sort of stuff I've been capturing. I've been slowing it down. If you look... Um... Oh, yeah. Just watch it sit slowed down. Yeah. This is how fast these things go. They're very fast, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. There you go. Yeah. What's that? That's a little interesting thing, isn't it? Yeah. Got a few of them. Yeah. These are things you call skyfish. No, not these. No, these. These are spinning jennies. No, these are no. These are different things. Look at this one. Watch this. No, these are just. I don't call these anything. These are in the book. Yeah. But you'd always miss that. But when you look at it, when it slows down, have a look. Because there's only in a couple of frames. That's very. I mean, how so? Look, look. Do you see this is 50 frames per second? Um, this is 25, this 25 is my old percent. one. But that's still like moving really, it's only in about 3 frames. Yeah, yeah. So that's moving very yeah, fast. Watch this, look, watch this change its form as mm. it comes down. Mm. You hardly notice it. Then it'll slow down, um, and then as it slows down you'll see it change form. It ends up looking like a guitar. So this is just kind of showing, you know, the speed of these things. But when you see the individual ones you'll see I see the front, see the picture there. Yeah. Now watch it now. Now watch the next one. Yeah. It does look like a guitar, yeah. yeah. Just and there's some other ones on here. That's the jellyfish. Okay, so. But I can send you all these pictures mm. that, if you want. Here's some yeah, other stuff. Here's some of the other stuff that mm. I've captured. So a lot of them are just appearing in one frame, so yeah. Mm. Some of my favourite ones. Yeah. Oh that's that. Oh that's lovely. Yeah, you see those in the book. Now it's um Yeah, these are the coloured versions of them. These are the Yeah. I mean, that's a fish. I call these fish. These ones like... Um, these are what I call sky fish. Mm. That's like a four-winged thing there, yeah. Yeah, so that was just kind of a few things on there. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, I've got loads of different stuff. I've made the, different ent the Entities one, and I've got all sorts of... Um, um, things called the spinning genus. Yeah, it's sort of the spinning genus. And the plasma plasmatic gliders. Um, these are weird looking things. I mean, it's not the best footage, this isn't, but it was, um... I used a normal camera and nothing came out on the normal camera. I didn't mm. see anything, but... At first you think they're butterflies, but when you see them slow down, you see they've got... They move. They're all attracted using the Cloudbuster, all these. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I call them spinning genes. You'll see why when you see them moving. 
Um, and there's some other ones that look like paper aeroplanes that I call the gliders. Mm. Um, this is something I made ages ago, this was. Mm. Um, yeah, hidden reality, perhaps about number two. Um, check out some of this. They're totally invisible. I mean, obviously I didn't say anything at the time. And nothing showed up on the normal, on the normal mm. camera. But this is show. Yeah, look. It's like it's flopping. It's like a. It looks like one of those manta rays. Those fish. I mean, this is. A, it's like it's. Yeah, it's like it's flopping end over end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here's the, one of the gliders. Yeah. You see some close-ups of them. Look, they disappeared and yeah. they sort of come back. And so you get you got a, you get a response on the Geiger counter when these things. No, no, I not with these. I've just okay. took the pictures of these. Um, they they fly like V-shaped bits of paper upside down. Mm. I've got a really good close-up. Um, there's a swarm of them. Look, look. Here's how this is the spinning jennies, and you'll see a one glider mm. go by. But they go like that. They spin because they sort of rotate. They yeah. rotate. There's a glider, and you'll see another thing go whistling off up there. But you'll see some close-ups coming soon. Yeah. My sister was out there when that happened. There's another swarm of them coming out. Mm. You watch them, look, they go in the air, then they start spinning, look. Yeah, they rotate, that's it. How odd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got some good close-ups of them, though. Look, yeah, mm. look. The sceptic would say that's just leaves coming off the trees, being blown no. in the wind. It doesn't matter. But, but no, the, the thing no, is... Look, watch these, look. Yeah. You can see these, these trees, trees not actually um, moving very much, which means there's not mm. very much wind. And... Um, I mean, it looks look, white. Look, look, look. Oh, yeah, look. That's, oh, that's amazing, you see. There you go, look. Yeah. When you look at a slow down version, look, it's a fish shape. Yeah. They look icy, these leaves, but it's actually it's actually because it's infrared. But yeah, I mean, that's like. There um, you go, there's how they move, look. Yeah. So, does the, are you using the cloud buster at this time? Yeah, yeah. That's funny because. It's a glider. It's a glider. Yeah. Wilhelm Reich talked about yeah. this sort of thing. Look how these fly and twist in the air. Yeah. Because um, he used to, he used to mention that when he was operating his cloud busters at all yeah he'd see things you get like you get strange things in the sky and what's what other other cloud buster operators have said that they oh, definitely yeah, yeah they describe it as like bees to a honey pot that's an actual photograph taken of them yeah look yeah. at the old aircraft there's a conventional aircraft there yeah yeah, yeah. Like a close -up, yeah. but there's a glider in a minute that comes down um, straight towards me I nearly fell over I thought it was going to hit me but you see these are the glider ones they. Mm. They just rise straight up into the air like paper aeroplanes. They're like V-shaped, and yeah. you'll see one in a minute that comes down like that. There's another one, the spinning ones. Don't mm. they? Isn't that amazing? Yeah, they're strange-looking things. I've got to get some better footage. Look at this. Watch this. Oh, blind! Yeah, watch this slow motion. Look, yeah. look, look how it moves its wings to adjust yeah. itself. And it, it's like a flying. It's like a. So do you think it's using like an aerofoil action on it? It actually has wings and it's flapping. Yeah, she watch its wings. It, yeah. it goes like that. As it, it looks like in. one of those flying squirrels. You know the ones with the with the skin stretched. Yeah, out yeah. I mean, they're, they're totally yeah. invisible. I mean, I've got all those sort of things, and I've got um, I've got a load of skyfish stuff. Mm. I've got all sorts of um, different mm. things on there. Is that is the following is this footage we just saw? Is that recorded at not in daytime? Yeah, it's all daytime mm. footage. That's yeah. not really a bat, is it? Oh no 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 no! I mean they're invisible. They didn't come out. I didn't mm. see them, and it didn't come out on. Um, so you didn't, they only came out on the film and the infrared. They didn't come out. Yeah, they didn't come out on the normal normal thing I was mm. filming. Um, yeah, I mean I've got obviously maybe the entity one like that, but I've got tons and tons of actual photographs of me as well. I've got mm. absolutely loads loads of photographs, um, with different sections, different things. Um, I've got all the ones um, on the website. What are these? Course, you know, just, you know, books of photographs. Well, these are actual ones that are in the book. Right. These are the coloured versions of them, um, but I've got okay. the full. I've got the full size versions of them. Um, a lot of these. Now that this is a particularly interesting one. Um, yeah, we've got two two versions of it. Look, here you go. Yeah. Now this. Now this. See, you you mention uh, you often describe your these images of resembling biological entities. So you use something like jellyfish, skyfish, yeah. and you 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 say that these don't appear to be mechanical. Yet we have one. One, this particular one does have this mechanical feel to it. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it's it? The, um, it's weird. It's very strange. To me, I mean, when I first saw it, I thought that that looks like a compact fluorescent light bulb, you know, like you'd get anywhere yeah. in your house. I mean, it has these rods sticking out the back of it. It looks like a, like a light bulb. Yeah, oh, at least the top half does, at least. Strange. Yeah. yeah. If, you look at the different if you look at that's the first version. Yeah, but it has these... It's like going that way. Strange wings. Yeah. Mm. It goes that from left to right. It's not going that way. It's going... Mm. That's one of the most weirder ones I've got, then. There's that one there. Um, now, I mean, 
one thing that's very hard to ascertain here is altitude. Now you can you could say these are very very low. I mean you could say they're moving quickly and they, and they look small. They're they're low, but it's possible they're, they're at a much higher altitude because you can't always judge. Can well, you? if you notice what I do is basically I think I focus on um, the edge of a roof. Mm. So basically, what I do rather than going into infinity because it, the infinity can't cope quick enough to focus it in, so I focus on the edge of a roof, block the sun behind the roof, and then I focus there and zoom in a little bit. So anything that's in line with there. But anything that's too far back or too high, you won't see it, it'll look really small. So mm -hmm. these aren't that far from the roof, unless they're mm -hmm. huge and they're further back. See, it could be. I mean, um, it, it helps if there's a few couple of clouds in the sky and it, say, goes behind a cloud. That gives yeah, it like, a, a, lot lower than that, a minimum like, range. Yeah, you wouldn't, see, you wouldn't see them there. They seem to be yeah. a lot lower, because I've done tests with um, throwing balls in there to see how near a ball would look. Yeah. Um, but I think they are actually where they look like they are, above mm -hmm. the rooftop. Because it doesn't seem to have that much of a depth. It could only perhaps go back about... 10, 15 foot and get a clear enough. Mm. So it's like, yeah. um, so these are quite small, these are small objects, these are these like... Uh, yeah, that small big, ones, like yeah. that, that big. Yeah. I mean, for instance, let me show you this one back here that you liked a minute ago. Uh, as a picture of a fly. On, when this, is, this one there is looking yeah. straight up the roof. Now, mm. if a fly was on there, a fly would probably be... If a fly was on there, it would probably be about the size of that. Yeah. A tiny little thing like that, if it was on the edge of the roof. I've got a moth crawling down there and it's absolutely yeah. tiny. So, I mean, the actual, simply the focus of the object, I mean, it's obviously in focus. Yeah, well, I focus on oh, the yeah. edge of here, so right. anything that comes in fo in line with that or behind it, um, is lit, the sun's under there. So, so it's likely to be a similar range. Yeah, but it's only lit up, the thing is, it only, it's totally invisible until it hits mm. the sunlight, and then when it comes into what I call the illumination zone, mm. it lights up, and once past that, it's invisible again. Mm. It's almost like it's reflecting the ultraviolet light just for that split second. Mm. That's why you'll always see the light from here coming up behind. I'll make it just so that the light's poking up, so anything that mm. enters into there, by the time it gets there, you won't see it, it's invisible. I oh, see, so it's like, that's, that's, that's really the original one yeah. of that one. That's, yeah, that's a remarkable one. It looks like, a, looks like a flying light bulb. It has this, like, halo around it. Yeah, it's a very, very yeah. strange one. I mean, I've still got, these are all the pictures that went into the book, but I've got, yeah. you know. Where's that one that you're, there's one picture you're particularly proud of, and it's like a circular or blob-shaped object, just above a, a skyline. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? It's in the about? book, is it? Yeah, it's um, the one you said you were particularly, you were particularly pleased with. Yeah, so, well, these are infrared ones. It's, um, um, if you go through them, I'll probably see, you'll see it. But that's that's one across the helicopter. When the helicopters yeah. come over, I took that, caught that. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's so it's like yeah. a humanoid. Because a lot of humanoid type things mm. are appearing when people do these. Um, this is the one that I um, suddenly had the urge to take a photo of, and it that was right above me. Mm. Um, That's an odd one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's a very strange one because um, it was fluttering like mad, and then it went straight up mm. there. No, you see distinct structure on that, can't you? Yeah, it's doing one massive <laughs> there, yeah. and then the next one. Um, but it only appeared. A lot of these only appear in the one or two. That was a good one because it hits. You can see it yeah. going straight into the illumination zone, and then turning into that. Yeah. That, and that's a strange one as well. Yeah. It's one of the weirder ones. That's in the book. I mean, the book covers the, the better ones. I mean, obviously, I've got the ones that I've taken more recently. Um, since my cat died, um, I obviously started going out and um, taking. Yeah. Now this is interesting because you these are ground level objects now. Yeah. They, they, this they, is your cat's grave. Um, well, they, they, this is a greenhouse one. Yeah. Oh, show the greenhouse one first. Cause I remember you showed me. You showed me yeah, the this is the first thing we've got, which is mm. that, um, that guy stood there holding a lamp of some sort. His arms coming up there, and holding yeah. a lamp. His arms coming, holding something to his mouth there. So that was the first one I got. Yeah. Um, I mean, does it, um, of course, are you sure this is not just a reflection of the flash bulb? No, that one isn't. No, this one, these ones are. These, mm. I, I did, this is the flash bulb. I did the flash in there just to light it up, but the infrared camera only sees a small part of the red out of the visible mm. light of the flash. It doesn't see the full white flash. Mm. But it's enough to light these up so that they appear. So there appears to be an object um, in there. Yeah, yeah. If you look at it closely, you'll see yeah. eyes in it. Yeah, it's a, that's, oh, that's a spooky thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is how, this is original how it looked. Mm. You just see the red light there. It's yeah. reflecting. You can see on the next one what I did. I hit the light into the into the greenhouse, and if I light it up a bit, you'll see. And that's yeah. not in the greenhouse. That's no. not in the greenhouse. It looks a bit like um, was it Freddy, the Doctor Jonathan Reed's alien? Yeah. <laughs> I know yeah. people laugh at him, but, but this is the next one I took, which convinces me that it's not beyond the window because it's. That's drawn down the curtain, and this continues over it. But it looks like mm. two 
Do you look at this? Look, you see eyelashes. Yeah. It's like it's got this pet pretty spooky, on yeah. its lap. Look, it's got a cat type thing. Okay. It's got a fucking horn as well. But look at the things above its head. That looks like demonic. Yeah, it does. That reminds me of that thing in Legend. Yeah, like, that, it, do you know that film Legend where there's this demon, there's this yeah, alien being, yeah, yeah. this weird devil-like creature. Yeah. Look at these snarling things in the back. They've got black eyes and yeah. teeth. But this, yeah, look, it's, it's holding something. Oh, look, it's like creature. a big black. It reminds me of the Virginia alien. Yeah, it's, it's really mean. It's holding something there. It's mm. got these two. It's like a thing into hell. The thing is, the windows. That's the blind, and it's still reflecting on the blind. So it's not behind the windows. It's yeah. beyond the windows. And this light is flashing back. It's hitting one side and going du, 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 into infinity. And he's appearing in infinity. Yeah. So that's the third one. And mm. then the next one I got um, was this one. See, the light of the flash is enough to like. Um, make these appear. Yeah. I aimed it in there, the guy came out and went off, and I aimed the flash in there to light the whole greenhouse up. But it only sees a bit of the red light, that's why it's mm. red and infrared. But look, you see. Oh, yeah. So I started getting stuff like that, and then after that I began getting, that's the one I took the other night. Yeah. I like this, they like a big... Now you've taken some like very interesting ones in the, in the back garden, because you, there's some of them are like you take these now this these mist these curls of mist that this one. is like the ones Derek Savory takes because yeah. um, Derek Savory is a friend of mine he does he takes a lot of these sort of like you get these etheric blobs of mist yeah it's invisible mist yeah. it's, there's no light source in this the mist is the light source it's mm. reflecting off everything and um, that was a one one second exposure these are some things that I caught flying right up in the sky and they're moving that fast within the one eighth of a second exposure that you can see all the the trails from it behind. Yeah. So these are things I've been taking at night. Uh, that's just an orb thing there. It's a couple mm. of orbs. But this is the cat's grave. Yeah. Now all oh, that's that's very weird because you have like these loops of Ellis Taylor takes pictures like this. Yeah, look at this guy. Like, yeah. yeah. Oh my god! It's like a grey in face. Yeah. Look, it appears again there. Mm. But this is two separate birds. These look like the daisies that I put on the cat's grave. Yeah. Really cra I was thinking they look like flowers, they look like, yeah, like yeah. daffodils or daisies. Yeah, I put daisies on his grave and I asked him yeah. if he was still there and that's come straight out of the grave. Yeah. And then after that I took um yeah, that's one I caught in the <clears throat> I was in the just I was taking yeah. pitch dark in the in the forest. Okay. Um, and then that's, now that is that's amazing, like a deer shaped creature, but it looks like a deer like almost. A face but like a face in the where the body two is. Two hands like that. It's, yeah. That's like a, some kind of frog or something, or a toad. Yeah, well, here's the proper photo. It's yeah. going... Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Yeah. But you can see them repeated in each thing. It's almost like they've gone... Whoosh. What was the exposure? How long was the exposure time? One eighth of a second. Oh, yeah. So that's something moving... It looks like something a light, something lit has moved very quickly. Gone, but look how it's like gone zigzags. It's gone in yeah. zigzags. Yeah, and you can see the actual same thing there. Look, the face. Mm -hmm. the eye. That looks like a face with eyes there. It's, mm -hmm. it's gone... Whoosh, 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 whoosh. Like that says so that one, and then I got the ones of Roy. My that's the, yeah, that's the one from Roy. That's the one. Mm. That's a fifteen-second exposure where the whole grave's lit up. Yeah. Um, I've seen this. I went and saw this grave on the other day. It was like yeah. Thing. And it's like it's like a swan. It looks like a swan's head. Yeah, it's got it's got. Um, you can't see this one there, but it's got um, scales like a. Scales. If I show, yeah. let me show you the original photograph that's taken. Um, I took a photograph just before it, and you can see what what the view should look like before that comes out. Um, Roy's own. This is it. Right. I took two photographs. This is the first one. Okay. All you can the graves down here. Mm. All you can see is the window, the lights from next door. But if you keep an eye on that thing there, can you see that? Yeah. Right. Watch this. This is the next shot. Oh, blimey! That's <laughs> so I took these yeah. in pitch dark, and that was the next one. But if you look at it on here, you'll see it's got look. Yeah, it's a lot of scale things. It does look like that. To me, it looks like a head of a goose or a swan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see it's got like a or, or a snake. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like maybe a fucking fish or something. So that's happening then. Also, this is happening. Look. Yeah, you got a mist down there. Some like um, there's some plasma. Yeah. Yeah, I've lightened this one up. I think and. Mm. Um, Yeah, I've lined it up here, you can see more of it here, look. It looks like a face there, a nose and eyes and... Mm. So, so yeah, I started, so these are the things I've been up to about the last year, taking all these other things and... Um, these row of lights, there's another one I took, pitch dark in the garden on the tripod. And we've got a massive guy counter here, I took one photo and got nothing, and the next one I got... 
Um, let's find the lights in a minute. The one with the lights, the strange lights, both treetops. Mm -hmm. That was the first. Sorry, that was the first shot. Um, okay, mm -hmm. and then this was the next shot. It's aiming straight up at a tree, pitch dark. But then the next one was. Oh, right, yeah. It's like um, that's uh... several sections. Oh, and yeah. let, look, it's, it's almost. But this is like flashing. It's got something flashing. See on that it, above it. it. And that's oh. being lit up by the lights from. Um, so you can only see that because it's. Do you think it's illuminated by the lights that are below it? Well, it's all invisible. I saw yeah. nothing. It's um, yeah. I this mean, is this the third light yeah. source. This is being lit up by this. Hmm. I've, I've actually lightened it a little bit. I've done some um, different versions of it, I think, to lighten it up. So that's the sort of stuff I've been getting um, using the Geiger counter. Um, where's, where's the 2016 stuff? Um, Oh, here it is. I think I've lightened it up a little bit, I've made it bigger. Here you go. You see it a lot easier there. Yeah, so there's several it. unlit sections. That's, yeah, so it's hard to see what that is, whether it's some kind of column with lights on it, or whether it's yeah, something moving yeah, you can with see. a flashing light on it. Yeah, well, I think it was... Flashing sort of crescent-shaped lights. It was definitely coming across. It was like it was a row of lights with that thing above it. Yeah. And um, you can see like a thing here, look, like a... Oh, yeah. So that was right above the trees. I mean, the last photo before that was like nothing, you know, it was um, just of nothing, and then that suddenly appeared. Mm -hmm. So this is like what I've been up since the last kind of year. I've been capturing all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, that's, that's quite amazing. And so yeah. so, so uh, yeah, thanks for showing us that, mate. That's uh, really, really good. That's quite... I mean, obviously, I've been doing some of this summoning stuff, okay. which I feel a bit uneasy doing sometimes. Um, Summoning in, is well, this like the um, is this like the uh, what's it called sky fishing you talk about in the book? No, this is when you actually like look into the sky and you relax your eyes and you think you say in your mind um, if there's any beneficial you know benevolent beings, sky beings in the sky, could you please show yourselves to me? And um, they'll appear in the sky. They look like other appears a balloon or a couple of balloons. Invisible light. No, not invisible. They oh, they come fully point. visible. You'll see them visible oh. in the sky. Um, but they, I had a lot of problems after I started doing that. And it's mm. just a problem. That's a that's so, a spot, um, like this. That reminds me a bit of the CE five protocols that Doctor Stephen Greer talks about. How you can actually summon. Yeah, well, yeah, well, this is, beings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the thing. But I'm starting to think if they're demonic, a lot of these beings. I start thinking, you know, the Lord of the Air was, you know, Lucifer, and all these beings. I'm starting to consider that they're not, these, they're not necessarily good because after I started summoning them, they'd appear within ten minutes. A couple of balloons would appear. All the birds mm. would go around in a big ring and the bird, these balloons would appear, they'd come right down over the house and when I flash the light they flash back to me and they'd start appearing, I mean I've even seen them appear as men walking across the, um, you know, across the sky. Um, so do you, do you have any photos of those? Say again? Do you have any photos of, of those particular Im entities? Um, yeah but only like they look like balloon type things but I've done them in the dark. Um, um, yeah, sorry. Um, just have, we'll have a look at them, I mean I'll have to put them on the, put them on the video. Um, let me see if I it would be the most recent ones that I took. Um, the website, hang on, let's have a look. If there's going on there, it's. Um, you can pull them up. It'll take them 16, 17. Um, I mean, that, that one there was um, was one that I. Right. That's straight out of uh, Close Encounters, that, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's like a. Like the lantern spacecraft on the closing camera. Yeah, it's like a person as well. Yeah. So I got that one from doing it, and then um, the next time I did it, I got. Um, the, um, that's the one, yeah, that was one of the ones that came down above the garden. Mm -hmm. That one there. Yeah, that's oh, that's the one. Yeah, it's like a globe-like thing. It's like yeah, yeah, it was one. pretty. It was visible as well. Yeah. Um, and then I got uh, this other one. Um, this is not just another one, it wasn't as good, but it mm. sort of appeared in the sky. And then after that I got um, a couple more, but this is this is from Summoning. Um, there you go. Yeah. Mm. And then um, this last one was from Summoning as well. Um, I can find it. Um, so we might find that one. There you go, yeah, this is it. That, that was from doing it as well. Yeah. So the guy counter went off and I was summoning all these things were shooting up from the sky, from the bottom, from the ground upwards. Right. Um, and this thing shot up. So I took a, took a photograph of that one. Um, but you see them in the daytime. You can actually see them in the daytime. I don't think there's anything there in that one. 
There's just some more actual stuff going off in the garden. Like, I had a massive, I, the guy counter went crazy, and all of a sudden these things were shooting up into the sky um, from straight out the ground. Mm. All of them. They're invisible, I didn't actually see them, they were all invisible. So this is kind of what I've been up to. I think these are orbs I've taken, might be a couple of orbs. Sometimes I get like some, quite a lot of orb things coming up. Mm. Um, you can see how... how yeah, as I like stand around sort of orb type things. Yeah, here you go, they're moving up, shooting up into the air. Mm. So um, I photographed one a bit like that when I was at the Andrew's house, I remember. One a bit like that. That was ten years ago now. Yeah, so there's book pictures that I showed you. I've actually got proper JPEGs of those, um, bigger pictures because of, these have been cut down for the book. And I've got um, ultraviolet. That's the ultraviolet stuff. Um, I've got all my old fold folders in there. This is the ultraviolet stuff. Um, this is kind of my early, some of the early things that I caught in the ultraviolet. Um, there's mm. proper. These are like different versions, cut down mm. ones and. Do you often get the things sometimes? Does sometimes the same object appear in ultraviolet and infrared and not invisible light? Like so they'll appear off both ends of the spectrum, but still invisible. Um, yeah, well, they, I've only found that when I use um, the infrared and ultraviolet thing it's, as well. So I don't know which one they're actually appearing in. But I find most of the things I film in the infrared, in the ultraviolet, don't appear in the infrared. Mm. Um, that's another fish one I found the film as well. Right? Very mm. subtle as well. So yeah. these are kind of some of the. I mean, I've got the you know, original JPEGs of all these. Like mm. these are all, whole variety of different things. I mean, that was just from one year. And then in the next year, I went on and filmed so, um, a lot more of these things like that. Yeah, that's nice. That's really nice. So you know, I can send. I can send you a few of these. What's where we are now, ladies and gentlemen? Now I'm here with with Nick, and Nick has taken me to show you where. He had his encounter in 2008, the one we were talking about. So, uh, Nick, um, where, so where are we now exactly? So we're just near the alleyway, which I, um, if you come across here, this is the actual alleyway I was walking down. Mm. Um, there's a long alleyway that leads up near my house, which we normally come through. And what happened was, we came from the park, and straight through to the alleyway here. So you came then, through the park, through to the alleyway? Yeah, and then Elf, Elfie was like... Um, so it's going to be a bit closer because of the microphone, it might, it might not pick yeah. up what you say. So we got to about this point, of course it was really freezing fog and everything, and... Uh, yeah. This is Christmas Day 2008? Two, yeah, yeah, so, uh, that's it. Everyone was in their ho homes around here having dinner. Yeah. So they wouldn't necessarily have been... At, so were you the only oh, person yeah, around? Oh yeah, yeah, it was really, really misty and foggy, and um, I was just about to cross the road, basically, <coughs> to go straight up that long alley, which leads right up towards my house. And for some reason, Alfie insisted on wanting to go back down here again. So off we went down here, and um, you could hardly see. The clouds were so low that you couldn't differentiate between what was the sort of mist or fog and the clouds. So you couldn't see an awful lot. So we walked down here with Alfie, which is totally the wrong way because we'd just come up here in the first yeah. place. And um, Alfie started making some sort of whimpering noises, and we got up here. It's like a substation here with like a pyramid type sort of. Oh, right, I see it, yeah. So Is this in, inside this building here? Yeah, yeah, so we got to about here and Alfie was slowly sniffing all the way along here until we got up to about this point here. And then um, Alfie stopped. And all of a sudden I let, let him do what he was doing and I just happened to look up. And in the mist, sort of behind the tree, across there, um, I saw a, a glow coming, a slow glow pinky sort of orangey glow and it took a while to get here and um, there's basically a gap straight above this thing here in the clouds so I moved back to about this position so I could see what it was and within about a minute the craft thing came whatever it was came straight above the top of this probably about I'd say about 200 foot above maybe 300 foot maximum straight above the top of this and it was moving at no more than walking pace and you know my first the first thing I thought was wow it looks like a child's spinning top and it also reminded me of a, a lampshade I used to have, like a red lampshade, which was that shape. Anyway, it proceeded to go straight across there, in and out of the mist, and every now and then you could see it. Of course, it was heading straight across a housing estate, so I wasn't sure what to do. Um, I could have either gone back that way, down that alleyway, but I chose to come back this way. So, it, was, it must have been about three or four miles an hour, so it was heading straight across the top of these, um, these houses, this housing estate. At this point, I realised I hadn't got my camera because I'd got um, 
my other coat on and the camera I've got for Christmas Day, I'd sort of been around taking pictures of everything with it and got bored and left it in my other coat because I didn't think I'd need it for an evening walk. So um, at this point I didn't know whether to go back and grab the camera or whether to follow it, but I thought it would probably be gone by the time I get back, so <coughs> I decided to follow it. So what I did, I basically came onto this road here. And I sort of ran straight up to this road. I and mean, then this road bears right then left, but it brings you back round um, to the general path that this thing was actually moving in. But it kept disappearing completely, because um, the, 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 like the, the mist or the fog was that thick, and all you could see was a glow. And every now and then there'd be a pocket of where there wasn't any mist, and you could just see it as clear as anything. And it kind of slowly pulsated as if it was breathing, and the colour got more intense. So at this point, it was just beyond the tops of those rooftops. I mean, so it's yeah. probably about 150 foot or so above the top of the rooftops and still moving quite slow. But the, the other road would have took me right out of the way, so yeah. I figured this was the best option. So. so I sort of came around this way. Bit more of a wide open space, I just wanted to get a view and see where it was actually going. So I sort of ran up here, yeah. okay. Yeah, sort of dra dragging Alfie behind me. Poor Alfie. And Alfie, Alfie noticed this thing too, the dog. Yeah, well, he started making a whimpering sound, he started acting really strange. And he doesn't normally want to go back up the same alleyway we've just been down. So, um, I figured this was probably the best area for me to see it from. So, as I got <coughs> around here, it gave me a much clearer view. Um, yeah. And it was actually a, uh, just above some of those house roofs, just over the back of what would be these house roof, you know, the, the gardens beyond yeah. these roofs. Um, and the, the road at the end curls back round and goes down to the park, which is where I ultimately ended up. And that's when it slowed right down and sort of stopped above the park. At that point, I got a bit unnerved and I decided to run back and get the camera. And so I just ran and ran and ran, fell over a couple of times and uh, got the camera, raced back with my other dog, um, no sign of it anywhere, I couldn't see mm. anything. So I just sort of disheartened at that point, walked all the way home again and um, had a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. I thought, damn it, I'm going back out again. <laughs> so I went another way, all the way to the park and hung around for ages. On the way to the park, I suddenly saw a, a flash, then another flash. I fumbled around, dropped the camera on loads of occasions, kept trying to take photographs and I was trying to film. And in the end, I, I got lots of sort of really shaky footage, but one frame showed the exact shape of what I'd seen. Mm. Although it's very small, I had it blown up, but um, exactly the same shape as what I'd seen. Yeah, and that's the thing we, we showed, we looked at earlier, the, the big uh, sort of almost ovoid shaped object. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But um, now yeah. I know you. We, I think we might have talked about this before. But uh, just I, I think we talked about it earlier on. But um, can you describe the object again? What it looked like? The closest thing I can put it to. My little nephew used to have a, a spinning top, which used to press down this thing on top, and it'd spin. No, no, the thing. It looked very mean, much yeah. like a spinning top, but with a little sort of dome on the bot on the top and a dome on the bottom. And as it was moving, it didn't look metallic at all. It looked like it was made up of loads of different coloured lights, but they all blended into one. And as it moved, it almost like breathed, sort of like a. And on, you know, on, on the cusp of the, it went bright orange and red. Then it went back fainter again. And it, it was like, and it was it was probably about three mile an hour, I reckon, walking pace. Yeah. And um, you know, I wanted to go around knocking on the doors, going UFO, UFO, but it was all quiet and it was freezing cold fog, you know. And yeah, I was just the only one there, um, you know. And I expected it to be in the papers um, after Christmas. I thought it was going to be front page and <laughs> wasn't mentioned. Nothing. No such luck. Yeah. <laughs> no. So. You know, so I thought, right, you know, I knew then and there that UFOs are real and they exist, and it's a life changing moment. It is, yeah, it is. Totally life changing. Yeah. So that's why I began my quest to start filming, you know, yeah. in the invisible after I found out about the work of Trevor James Constable. So that's Christmas Day so, 2008. Yeah, mm. yeah. That's very well, because I mean, listen, regular Christmas viewers Day will evening. know this, but um, regular viewers will know this, but I mean, I actually was, I actually had an encounter with a. A circular shaped object or, or spherical. It was, well, I say close encounters, it was actually a distant object. Yeah. But it was um, it was a distinct white spherical object. 
and this was just a few days later on the 28th of December mm. so just a few days after Christmas yeah. on that same 20, 2008 yeah. that's when I saw what I did it was different from what you saw but mm. it was only a few miles away but up in Oxford Headington in yeah. Oxford so uh, well, I, I traced the route of where I thought it was coming from um, I did a route and it, I reckon it was heading straight for the army base mm. um, but you know I even considered ringing the police but I thought well, what are they going to do they're going to think I'm just on, you know, drunk or something or yeah. off my head or something so well you they'd have given they'd have sent you to the Ministry of Defence and they yeah. would have um, taken a report on Nick Pope or whoever was running the UFO yeah, desk yeah, and yeah, taken yeah, the this report thing. I just wanted to tell the world though it's just like oh my god there it is there it is um, it, it just changed me forever I had no interest in photography no interest at all I read UFO books and <coughs> you know the odd magazines but that's about as far as I took it I've never had an interest in photography mm. and all of a sudden I find myself plunged into you know getting myself a camera getting into the infrared the ultraviolet and then Quest for Invisibles was sort of born really so these last nine years really have been the core of your well, your, your well yeah yeah I mean I started filming in early 2010 nice. um, first thing I captured I think was April the 16th um, 2010 mm. and then in 2011 late summer I started um, filming in the ultraviolet so mm. um, so you've, you've gathered an awful lot of data in that time now I mean you've got hundreds of pictures oh, an awful amazing. lot yeah awful yeah. lot of videos and things you know which nice. I'm constantly putting together to try and make you know, little documentaries and things so definitely well, be good. well this is a this is a documentary that is, well, this is one I'm making but uh, you can make one of your own <laughs> but um, anyway I'm sure um, what the Hapano TV viewers would like to see now mm. is Let's go on a sky watch. Yeah. And see what happens. Okie doke. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, her Panama TV viewers, I mean, we, we uh, you may have seen me doing this earlier, because I mean, when I was here last time, Nick and I did a brief little uh, demonstration of Nick's Cloudbuster and how it works. But we're in daylight now, so it's a bit easier. But what, what this is, Nick, what's, uh, is this it? These just pipes. It's just an array of pipes, yeah. They're just yeah. like normal copper, are they copper? Well, what are they made of? Steel, steel pipes. Yeah, does it have to be metal? Yes, be like yeah, metal. They can't yeah. And they were arranged in this little. Well, I don't know. I, I've never tried yeah. it with anything different. I'm just going to put some water in that. They're just arranged here. Okay, so basically this is a set of pipes, and one ends in water. <coughs> now, um, this was actually invented a long time ago by a very maligned individual called Wilhelm Reich, who's actually a psychoanalyst. He's part of the inner circle of Sigmund Freud, who was the original psychoanalyst. But he fell out with the Freud network for, for, for obvious reasons. Um, but he came up with this, what he called orgone energy. He, this is something he worked on his entire life. Um, and he, through various, various things. Um, he discovered that this can come from the human body, especially during um, sexual activity. But it also exists in nature. And um, he found out that it, that actually orgone energy can actually affect things such as weather patterns and he also noticed that UFOs appeared whenever whenever he was um, he was working on this so we have here he's just arranging this here's some water here which, this is well water from, from the ground from the ground which is um, which is you need you need one end in groundwater and the other end pointing at the sky and it actually channels all going energy it acts as a conduit of all going energy from in the same way that um, a, a bolt of lightning acts as a conduit for electromagnetic energy from the potential difference of the sky yeah, to the ground. Right, yeah, hmm. yeah. I mean, it's, it's um, in theory it causes different differentials in atmospheric, you know, conditions that underlie certain existences, you know, hmm. in the sky. Um, but you mentioned earlier that this actually affects the local magnetic field as well. And compasses will point. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, hmm. when I first got these pipes. Um, they're from an old gazebo, actually. My sister's that she's thrown away. They, they exhibited um, no magnetic qualities at all. But if you go near it now with a compass, it will flick it back around the opposite right. way. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, we've just got to wait for mm. to get it up to about there. And then, um, show you. It might take a little while. Yeah, no worries. That's it. Um, but I'll. Uh, this is the camcorder used. Now, this is um, your camcorder pointing up. At the sky, and hopefully, well, with this be pointing exactly where this is pointing. Right. So you, this is like the. So do the do the actual objects appear in the uh, direction where these pipes are pointing? Exactly. Right. All, the time. all those UFOs I showed you, the discs, all of them mm. directly. I normally film above that one up there, mm. um, but this is a shorter version of Cloudbuster. So the reason mm. I film above trees is that I always like to have some kind of reference point, um, whether it be a tree or a roof or something that mm. helps to give a bit more of a an idea as to the size of it and um, I think it's better than just a plain sky shot yeah. at the time, much better so. 
Did you say that the police actually flew over once and hovered over in a police helicopter? Yeah, for quite a while, yeah. yeah. And I've had quite a few drones coming over, which is a bit worrying. So well, this, this does look a little bit like a rocket launcher. I mean, for, for, if you didn't know any better, you could say it was like an, an anti-aircraft missile or something. Yeah, well, that's the thing. You know, I expected them to come knocking on the door after this. Sort of yeah. Thing, but, um, obviously, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh dear, all right, so this is just filling up now, we're just going to fill this up and then we're going to start, um, we're going to start filming. Right, this is very interesting what I'm going to show you now, Nick has brought a compass and um, we're going to demonstrate what we were talking about earlier about the way the compass actually changes. You see the, the needle there, it's moving slightly off, it's going way off north there, see? Yeah, look. Yeah, see? It's going way off north, yeah, there's okay. definitely a, an alteration in the magnetic field of the locality here. Which didn't exist at all, um, yeah. obviously when I, when I first... Is, yeah, very strange. Yeah, it's magnetic and long, and long this, Look, it's it? up here, it really, really goes. Do you see that? Oh, yeah. that's Lissac, yeah, look at that. It's, that's way off north, that's several degrees. You pass it over like this. Mm. Look, here you go, look. Definitely, uh, and these are, this is just normal steel, They're not, it's not magnetic, it's, oh sorry. It, was, it wasn't to start with, no. it had no magnetic properties. There's no the magnetic time. field in the, st the actual steel, no it's no, just no, not no. magnetic. No. <clears throat> Basically, what I tend to do is um, select a tree or something to film above like this, stick this end in here, um, and then I basically set up the camcorder. Mm. So look, you might be able to see the view through. This is, I'm not so any this filter. Is a this is the view view. This is yeah. my through the, through what sort of camera is this? It's a um, Sony. I like a bit like the one I'm using. Yeah, it's a Sony. It's a Sony Handycam. Oh, so nice. what I'll do is I'll aim above the tree like that, and then I'll zoom in somewhat, mm. um, come back down a little bit, mm. and zoom slightly out, and then I'll just basically film this section of the sky. Um, obviously, it's not so good today because there's no sun. Yeah. But as you can see, this is a view that you'll see. That's full spectrum. Yeah. That's. Um, Infrared, visible light, and um, ultraviolet. Oh, cool! So this, this, have you got a filter on this at all, or is it just um, not at the moment? It's right. just too dark. There's no sunlight out, so it'd be too dark to see anything. Yeah. They rely heavily on yeah. um, sunlight. Um, now, this is just obviously we just this is just a demonstration. But normally, yeah. what's the best weather for conditions, and what's, what's the best time of day um, for doing this? I found the best time is when you've got a nice blue sky, crisp blue sky with um, with the sun. I wait till the sun goes behind the trees, and that way. <laughs> Um, anything gets anything that passes sort of above the trees gets illuminated by the sun, which is hidden out of view of the camera. Right. Um, and I like to film against a pure blue sky, and then it's a lot easier to see anything that comes by. Mm. Um, this film's at 50 frames a second. Right. A second. So obviously I'll have to sort of sit and look through every single frame. Um, sometimes I record for six or seven hours in little bits. That must take ages then, searching every frame. Three or four weeks sometimes. Yeah. Just non-stop. You know, I've had to start wearing glasses recently. No. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Oh dear. But this is basically it. Normally I'll have an infrared camera, um, which I'll start snapping pictures yes. in a general direction as well. And then later I'll put that on a tripod and shoot in movie mode. Right. Um, but this is generally it. Um, so is it ro is this rolling at the moment? Are you recording at the moment? Is this recording? Um, this is, yeah, recording at the moment, yeah. yeah. Right, so, yeah. Um, so this is the moment you're... This is it. So it's just, we're just waiting to see what... This is it now, this right. is it. it's actually recording, recording now. So, okay. so what I'll generally do is just keep it fixed on that area of the sky. Um, yeah. Is it, so where, this is where the cloud buster exactly is pointing? Right, yeah, exactly where the nice. cloud buster is pointing. It's a very simple device, you just stick this in, in the water. Grounded in water, yeah. I did oh. have, an, uh, my other one had, um, I had about eight or nine pipes mm. on it. And mm. um, I had them fixed to other pipes that could run you know a fair distance like hose pipes but I found it's better just to put these straight into the water mm. rather than having a more complicated you know fixtures yeah. this is just back to basics this is the most basic version of the cloud bus you can get mm. um, this is it you know yeah, so. the, uh, the ones that I used to use you used to, you used to have like 20 foot pipes and things like that oh, yeah, yeah, very, well, I've got very on sophisticated there. ones I've got, um, <coughs> yeah, I've got some more pipes I could put on there as well. I've got mm. a few more of these at home. This is just a framework for one of those gazebo tent like things. Oh, right. yeah. It's just to throw it away, so I thought I'll have mm. that. So these um I mean the uh it was Reich who first observed that visible visible UFOs used to flock to his Cloud buster when he was using it oh, in his yeah, at the org at the um, organ on the, the centre yeah, he set up yeah yeah and um, he and he that's when people started laughing at him and they thought he was crazy. Well, they the cloud buster at them and apparently they disappear at the time. So yeah, I and mean, he he had plans to build a weapon. He was he thought that we might be invaded yeah, and he had yeah. plans well, to build he, a weapon using organ and energy. Gun or something, yeah, well, it's, so. it's possible, you know, that his work went black and it, it, it was well. By, what I mean by it went black, oh, the government appropriated it and, and classified it. And Reich himself died in prison in 1957, just um just a couple of weeks before he was due to be released. Yeah, well, another woman, uh, Ruth Drown, had a similar um, yeah. thing. She she did radio vision. 
Right. Um, that's a whole other story, mm. but um, you know, she's able to, um, to tell people's conditions just using a drop of blood, you know, and stuff. And it's amazing how many of these people end up in jail and dead. Oh, yeah. It seems to happen yeah, all the time, doesn't it? This is the thing. Yeah, this is the thing. These but people I mean, invent these things, these... Well, that's these it. I mean, you know, this... I mean, cloudbusters, they definitely attract UFOs. Mm. Uh, uh, both, you know, craft-like uh, objects as well as uh, the biological types. Mm. Um, I mean, the, the things I filmed, the spinning jennies and the plasmatic gliders, have always been like where the cloudbuster is aiming mm. all the time. It's almost like they're attracted to it. Um, but obviously it's better, it's a bit grey today, but um, on a blue sky, it's, you know, you've got a pure blue sky, um, it's much better, you get a crisp yeah. sort of image. Unfortunately, we, I mean, the weather forecast said broken sky, and I thought I would have to do. Yeah. This is Britain, after all, this is Britain, ladies and gentlemen, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But there we have, this is, uh, I so don't... This is generally what I'll do I'm not for three or four hours a day, if not six sometimes, in, yeah. in, you know, in summer. So you'll just leave this recording for... Yeah. All that time. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, um, then you'll take the camera, take the recording upstairs. Yeah, and just look through. And just look through the frames. Yeah, well, what <laughs> I've learned now, what I've learned now is that I've, it's such a hassle. I, I normally record in 10 minute portions. Mm. Um, I keep, I put uh, my alarm on my phone, and every 10 minutes I put it off and put it back on. And that way, um, it's not too overwhelming to sit and look through 10 minutes worth. Sometimes, if you're trying to look through a two hour recording, it's just too much because your eyes get tired and you're more likely to miss something. So yeah. I tend to do a t like a 10 minute recording. Um, so I end up like with literally, you know, hundred, hundreds, hundred or so 10 minute recordings. I mean, yeah. I've still got some from two years ago I've not yeah. even looked at yet. So these things, I mean, like, I know you were, d you were misrepresented in the news but when you, because you were on BBC Radio Oxford a little while yeah, ago. Well, you know what I think of the bloody BBC. You know what I think of the BBC. What was the name of the, what the what's his name there? Mal uh, Malcolm Boyden show. Malcolm Boyden, that's, that's it, yeah. yeah. Um, Matey Boy's on there as well. Professor Brian, Brian Cox. Cox. Yeah, well, yeah, what yeah. an amazing exp If it could be proved true, it would be remarkable. Like, oh, yeah, like hell. He wouldn't, he would still deny it. That bloke would still deny it. Yeah. But, um, I mean, what's, uh, I mean, the, obviously, you know what I think of the BBC? They're, they're designed to distort and to um, m well, manipulate definitely. and mis mislead people. Well, they haven't called me back on the show since. I did send yeah. out a copy of my book, Question Invisibles, but. I haven't heard anything back. So. And one of the things they said was <laughs> that, that pissed me off. They said, "Oh, uh, the headline I think was something like, oh, Oxford, uh, Oxfordshire man sees sea creatures in the sky.'" Oh, that's um, a, yeah. Of course, um, in the sky above Radley. Or yeah, of course. Things. But of course, the thing is, like, that's that's a complete. You you, you use these words like skyfish, jellyfish, etc. But those are metaphors. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the jellyfish, um, which features in my book, actually did look like a jellyfish. It had tentacles, mm. and it was travelling tentacles first. And I need for my own. No, mind, I need to categorise them into things, just, you know... That's all right, I mean, people like criticise Dr Judy Wood the same way, the 9-11 the researcher, because yeah. she uses terms like wheat checks, uh, Cheetos and, and things, and she uses would like, dustify, and people say, well, that's not scientific, those aren't scientific terms, and she said, well, I've had to invent metaphors, because these yeah. are completely new phenomena. Hey, look, there's a... That, ladies and gentlemen, believe it or not, is a rare sight in Britain, it's some blue sky. Oh, wow. Yeah. Enough to make a sailor's pair of trousers, as my daughter's <laughs> grandmother used to say. So uh, let's hope that if let's see what we catch with that. Yeah. Is it still recording? Yeah, it's always recording. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it's, basically this is like sky fishing. Um, when I film the inf the ultraviolet stuff, rather, I do it slightly differently. I block. What I do is I block the sun behind the roof, mm. and then what I do is I zoom into the edge of the roof. Um, so say the sun's behind there. What I'll do is I'll move back so that the sun's just lighting up the you know the edge, the top edge, and then I'll zoom in slightly, and then I'll leave it filming like I'm here. Um, and that's how I catch all the pilot stuff. Um, anything that comes across the top gets <coughs> illuminated. Um, it's, I mean, I call it the illumination zone, um, which is from the top of the roof up, yeah. and sort of so so far along. And anything coming into that zone or just above it, it becomes totally illuminated just for a fraction of a second and becomes you know visible in the ultraviolet. Um, and after that, as soon as they move past that point, they generally become invisible once again, even to the lens of the ultraviolet camcorder. So um, some of them are self-illumed. Um, they, you know, they are their own light source, um, but not not as many as the invisible ones. You know, a lot of them seem to be invisible unless they're lit up. Yeah. And then even then, they're invisible in the ultraviolet or the infrared once they're not lit up. So. Um, yeah, that's so, a. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of work put into for this. I mean, you do, yeah. You, I know you put, you do an awful lot of this. Um, I you spend film, all I can film for you know eight hours and just get one frame showing something. Yeah, and take, that takes patience. That takes patience to do that. Like you 50 know. frames a second, you know. 50 frames a second is like that means if you're got so you're if you're it can take you weeks to go through it because like if you're if you're it's filming for eight hours and it's 50 frames a second yeah I, I can't even calculate how many that is thou um 3, a minute, but yeah so that's 
So you're talking about seconds. up to a million. 60 seconds, yeah. yeah. That's so, uh, that must take a long time. Oh, yeah, it is a long time, yeah. This is the thing, and some of these things might just appear on uh, mm. one, two or three frames. If they're a bit mm. further away, they'll obviously appear on more frames. Um, but my latest video, what I'm trying to put over in that is with the insect thing, is that, you know, insects do stretch um, when mm. you use this, you know, the recording technology we have today, which is the uh, interlaced video. Yeah. So um, that's why it's important, really, to watch what you're filming all the time, make sure you know what's going across. Yeah. Well, you know, viewers, go to the link in the description box. That's Nick's channel. He's just producing a documentary. I've just seen a little sneak preview of it. It's going to be up pretty soon if it's not already up when this video goes to the get is uploaded. So please do check that out. Or fiction. Mm. Yeah, that's good. That's that's right. Yeah, so uh, yeah. that's good. So I'll be going into um, sky fishing for sky fish and for invisible UFOs. Um, mm. Yeah, and there's plenty of information on my website as well, um, talking about many many different aspects of the invisible reality yeah. entities. Check the link to that, ladies and gentlemen. Spirit, yeah. spirit energy. Um, yeah, it'll all be there. It'll all be in the description box, so you can um, you can check out more of Nick's work. Yeah, how long have we re how long have we been recording for then, Nick? How long we, how long have we been recording for now? Give it to about ten minutes or so, I think right. now. Yeah. Should we should we see if we've captured anything? Yeah. Okay, we'll we'll do that. I have to load it onto. The okay, we've returned to Nick's command centre here in Abingdon, Oxfordshire, uh, just after doing a bit of filming, and so this is your computer. So, um, what do you do next, Nick? What's the next step in um, this process? The next step, really, is to load it onto, um, this, because this is a new camcorder, I basically, right. I've got the software on this, because this computer doesn't go online, so, hmm. it's basically just a matter of, um... You just copy it to the computer, basically. <coughs> just, yeah, just a simple shot of the computer, just put the laptop and, yeah. um, So here's the camcorder in the box, and, um... Bring him on in, if I can find the... You just need the interface, don't you? Oh, sorry, you need to get the interface. Yeah, I have to... Just Nick's uh, laptop there. This is just uh, just what I do basically. You put you just connect it via the USB interface yeah. and copy it over. Cool. That's it. So uh, what have we? Let's have a look at what we've captured. So this is your, this is your, uh, we've just copied the footage. Is this the footage that we just captured? Just took just now, yeah, out in the garden. Yeah. Right. Now, um, so you go through this, is it, you, you use Windows Movie Maker normally for this? Um, one? I looked through it first. Um, let's see. So this is what well, the class... Oh, you can hear my... Yeah. Turn the volume down. Um, is so, yes, it's all right. Right. So this, well, I mean, they, like, this, everyone's already heard this. Be so, so. This is a full spectrum picture. This is um, infrared, um, ultraviolet, and normal light. Right. So this is more than what you see with the naked eye. Yeah, I would have used an infrared filter, which cuts everything out, but infrared. But it's just far too dark today. Yeah. But normally, I'd have the sun down below these trees. Um, mm. and then anything going over the top will be lit up as they come over, and that's how I film. But this way, it covers the sky going right the way back, and you'd be surprised, you know, things will come from like miles away to the cloud bus, so they'll gradually get nearer and nearer and you'll see them move up. Yeah. Well, of um, right, so many oh, people who operate cloud buses tell me that UFOs, it's like bees to honey, they flock to the cloud buster. They seem to, and yeah. Seem that the cloud, something about the orgo and energy seems to be connected to the UFO phenomenon. Well, the thing is, I've, I've attracted quite a few discs and a few, and, and it's on discs like that, and it makes me wonder whether it's given us some kind of, um, you know, on another level, some kind of yeah. radiation on another level, and it's attracting them, they're concerned it about it, because, um, I've several times I've put the, as I showed you those discs earlier, you know, there's about five separate occasions where I've been filming and within about an hour um, some discs have come over, either one or two, they look just like flying discs. Mm -hmm. And as they go over the top you see like a, a lit area in the middle, mm -hmm. like a glowing area, but they all seem to be exactly where the cloudbuster is pointing. Mm. So this is a Hapanmo TV exclu exclusive, ladies and gentlemen. This is the first time this footage has been seen that Nick has captured. Yeah. And um, you never know what we might, there's ten minutes of this. You never know what we might see on it, but I mean the um, the idea of this connection between orgo and energy and um, and UFOs yeah. could be why Reich had so much attention from the from the authorities because he may have discovered something that they wanted to use. 
Well, it's an untapped power source, I believe. It's the mm. same with spiritual healing. It's just free energy. It's, it's just... not like electromagnetic energy. No, 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 no. It's, it's life energy. It's yeah. prana. It's you... the same as prana. It is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, with you the healing thing. Sorry, you were telling me about healing. Yeah, it's the same thing, basically. You're using your body as a vessel to, um, to send the energy through. <coughs> um, I believe it's, it's just natural energy, um, you know, um, that goes around the earth. Um, I believe the ancients knew a lot more about that kind of thing than we do. Yeah. I think, you know, we've gone backward in some way, I think. And I think in many ways we have. It's got a lot to do with the Illuminati. I know that's controversial. Not oh, they, ex they do exist. Yeah. They do exist. They're in all the key positions around the world. Yeah. It's got um, to do with the Illuminati and what they've done. Ever since Atlantis, they have been working their way to control the Earth. And they've kept this from us because they they couldn't rule us if, if we knew this about this secret. You know, I mean, the, their pharmaceutical industry would collapse. Well, everything would collapse. Yeah. This is the thing. Their energy, the oil industry, would collapse, um, and and well, it would it would it would be very beneficial for us because we could then restructure the economy to benefit people, um, rather than to to serve the uh, Illuminati. Well, it's like the free energy yeah. thing. You know, there's mm. quite a few people I've heard. You know, have I mean, a guy would run a car on water. Yeah. yeah um, what's his name? Yeah. Mayer. Well, I heard a story about some guy. Yeah, yeah, and they got they basically. Um, he ended up getting put in prison on some trumped up charge. He what? Well, yeah, he eventually died. Um, he I think. Because yeah. like, well, a lot of these people end up in jail. You know, uh, John Searle, he was jailed as well. Now, Wilhelm Reich was due to be released on the 25th of November, 1957. Yeah. And they found him dead in his cell. I'm surprised. Just lying dead in his cell. A bit like a Phil Schneider type affair. Yeah, now that's a guy who was... Uh, he predicted that he would be killed. And he says, if you, if, you, if you find me dead and it looks like I'm committing suicide, I haven't. Don't believe me. Mm. Mm. So well, that's the thing, you know, anyone who's got something worth saying um, needs to watch it, really, because they will <coughs> try and hush you up in some way. Yeah, oh, they will. I mean, Reich was one of these people. He was really one of these people. That's my dog trying to get Oh, bless him. There's a little dog outside the door. He's running around in here. Mm -hmm. so, so this is basically it for me. I, what I'll generally do is um, I'll, I'll put a version of this onto my other computer, and if it's a really long piece of footage, I'll just go through in double speed, and I'll just make note of any flash or anything unusual, and I'll go back and look at it much slower mm. um, so it takes a long time you know I've got to go back in and watch every single frame and remember there's 50 frames a second yeah um, and these things sometimes just appear in one frame and go um, you know several of the photographs I've taken they're only there in one frame maybe two maximum yeah well that amazing there's a bird well, so. a birdie, yeah but that amazing mm. um, that amazing sort of like metallic object you saw that was it. it's only visible in, th in two frames yeah yeah which definitely. are quite some distance apart which means it's traveled very quickly to travel, it was obviously moving very fast indeed. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, I was, I'm aiming straight, I was aiming straight up at the top of the roof, and the sun was blocked behind the roof. Um, and the object, um, I don't think it was directly beyond the roof, but it was much further over and probably much bigger. But it's just the angle it was at, it mm. disappeared behind the roof. Mm. Um, so, now we're so, this is basically all I do. I mean, I very often go out with a Geiger counter, and when I start getting um, a reaction from the Geiger counter, um, I start adjusting the, yeah. the camera. Because you can normally tell um, the direction when you get a Geiger counter hit, but obviously I'm, you know, I normally rely on a nice warm day with lots of sun. It's not ideal, I know. It's not, it's not an ideal day for filming anything. But um, really. it's, uh, it's still, you never know. We might, you might see something, and you never know what might appear. And if it does, well, that'd be quite something. Yeah. But um, this is just to demonstrate what Nick does. This is so you, you. This is you basically go through this until you eventually capture. You find something interesting. Yeah, I record for anything up to six hours, and also record using an infrared camera in movie mode. So, and I'll also use a normal camera. So I record with three different cameras. Mm. So that way, when I catch something, I can look and see what was in the view in the normal camera. So you normally I'd have an infrared filter on this um, camera, or I'd have like a. Mm. An X night UVR, which is infrared and ultraviolet, mm. and that blocks the visible light spectrum out, but lets the infrared and the ultraviolet. Mm. In other words, it passes um, the two invisible ends of the visible light spectrum, infrared mm, and yeah. ultraviolet. But um, obviously, things get lit up by the sun. Obviously, you know, all ultraviolet and infrared yeah. radiation. So um, very reliant on the sun, really. To that's a shame. That's a shame. We didn't have any sun. But that's Britain for you, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, that's Britain. That's <laughs> but um, you know, we couldn't unfortunately. <coughs> um, unfortunately, we wouldn't get. We, It'll be a couple of weeks before I next got the chance to come see you. Mm. Um, but we can, come, we can always do some more filming. And um, well, you're, uh, we've got, we got a little announcement to make. You, uh, you're interested, there's a conference coming up next year. Oh, that's right, yeah. And um, Dreaming Sources. The Dreaming really. Sources Conference. Now, I haven't actually finalised the details yet, but Nick has agreed to appear there. And um, we're gonna, he's either going to speak or we're going to do a dialogue. 
maybe show some videos and things like that. And um, yeah, yeah. But I'll, a presentation yeah. type thing. Yeah, they, I've, I've mentioned this on Hapanmo Voice, but and on Hapanmo Radio. But please, um, I will do a special Hapanmo TV trailer closer to the time when the Dreaming Sources conference will take place, because the July. Back in July, we did Roswell, the uh, Roswell 70 event. It went down so well that I want to do another one, and it's going to be called Dreaming Sources. It's a play on the nickname for Oxford, Dreaming Sp the City of Dreaming Spires. And um, it's going to have some brilliant speakers, and it's going to be sometime in May or early June, I reckon. Mm. That's what we're looking at at the moment. It depends when other conferences are, because I don't want any to overlap. But, Nick, you'll be able to see Nick there live. Yeah, yeah. I shall be talking about my uh, work with invisible UFOs in the skies over Oxfordshire. Skyfish, um, yeah, I quite look forward to that. Be Brilliant, good. yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, so we're still uh, studying this. Is nothing, nothing's happened yet. No, but, um, we'll keep, keep, uh, we'll keep. It's more of a demonstration, really. Yeah, yeah. I say a lot of it. Um, I've got some great footage of stuff going over the top of the trees. So mm. If you, um, if you, if you find that there's, you know, a, a clear sky with sun is is there. Um, yeah, could this be because do you, is it possible when well, I'm judging the range of these objects? I mean, like they can look like they're close or something. I mean, one, one thing I noticed from the from the pictures you showed me is the focus is pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah. Which well, indicates yeah. that they're roughly the same range. Yeah, well, I'm basically zooming halfway into the edge of the edge of the roof on there. Yeah. So, um, so I was just thinking that um, I was just thinking that. Uh, that could they? Could is it possible they might be at a slightly longer range than they appear? They could be. I mean, it's got quite a good depth of field. Here. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult to judge um, the range of objects in the sky. Like you see a big air, a big aircraft fly over. Well, this has happened to me. I see a big aircraft fly over, and it looks like a toy plane. And you think you can almost reach up and pluck it out of the sky, but yeah, it's actually nice. many. It's, it's actually at many. It's several thousand feet in altitude. It's because there's no, there's no visible gauge to judge distance. Well, this is this is what makes it hard. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, if you, have a look at this in a minute. These are some camcorder stills. I've got something. It's giving up people an idea of some of the stuff I'm catching on a sunny day. Oh, sorry, mate. I just kicked your cup of tea. That's all right. So, sorry, if mate. you look at here, right, um, okay. This gives you a bit of an idea of some of the stuff that. Um, Skyfish, yeah, look at that, yeah. Ultra Vulcans. Full spectrum Sony Handycam, look. It's possible, you see, that's at a high, that's actually sort of a larger object at a higher altitude. Yeah, you'll see some more interesting things in a Yeah. Mm. Let me just take a seat. So I can't stand for long because my arm's doing arthritis. It's annoying. I'm not used to this sort of thing. Oh. This is, uh, that's amazing. Just made this yeah. Entry. But that's. Uh, but I mean, I, was used to, I, I, would have, I inserted one of these pictures earlier, but some of these pictures, these sky fish are like. Yeah, you'll see some life footage yeah. of one, one creature in a minute. Sorry about kicking that thing. That's okay. But isn't that amazing? The. Um, yeah. Skyfish Factor. Is that the title? Yeah, Skyfish the title Factor. Of the right. Yeah. Mm. It's just mainly talking about insects. Now, images. this is an important point, right? Because a lot of the sceptics are going to go, oh, you're just recording insects and it's a, it's a camera artifact. Yeah. But you know the difference. Well, this is it. And if you these don't know, are these camera artifacts. Yeah. yeah, these are actual, this is an infrared skyfish. They're the large yeah. um, torpedo type. These are the different sorts. So can um, you, you can see the difference. I mean, it should be very obvious. Yeah. There is a difference between um, the the rod, like the rods, that is the the insects, which are it's simply because the, the frame rate is again now. And I think you'll yeah. see an image of um, there's a strange creature I caught that goes flying by in a minute. Mm. Um, let me see a minute now. Here we go now. Yeah, that's it's like it's got flapping wings. Yeah. And there's yeah. that really that's a really amazing thing. That's a metallic object there. You can see. Yeah. That's it. That's a few sneaky. Uh, it's from the video. <laughs> yeah. Right, so that's, that's a little teaser there for the video that's to come, which Nick is making, Quest for the Invisibles. Definitely. Right. So there's no uh, there's no software you can get hold of that makes this job any easier. Does it still need the human uh, eye to the, detect uh, these the things? Human eye is very very important. Um, mm. Very important. Yeah. I mean, I I normally now record for ten minutes at a time, and um, ten minutes is it's quite a nice period just to sit there and look through every frame. Um, so I generally look through at the normal speed, or, or perhaps if it's a really long piece of footage with not a lot happening, I'll do it double speed, and I'll keep going over it and slowing it down and make a note of every point where something interesting comes by. Mm. But you know, I film sometimes for two or three months and just capture one image. Yeah. I mean, 
Did, if you look in my book, What's Invisible, which was recently published yeah. by the book tree, you'll see dozens of images in there. So, you know, they, they took me five years or more mm. to capture those images. I mean, sometimes I'd film for two weeks and I'd just get one image yeah. out of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of frames. So it doesn't happen every time. You've got to be patient. It doesn't, you don't oh, get very you don't pick patient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even with the Cloudbuster, because, you know, it's okay these things being um, attracted to you, but if they rely on the sun to actually um, light them up, and you're not in the right position when you're filming, even if the Glocka counter goes off, you know, you might be filming straight up into the sky and they might be over here. So um, it's hard. It's hard to judge. Um, yeah. It's not easy. I mean, I'm learning bit by bit over the years. You know, I've, I'm learning certain things, what to do and what not to do. Hmm. Um, but this is why I started filming for a year just in the infrared at night using my um, Glocka counter. I had to have a break from all this monotony, you know, the monotony of actually sitting out there and filming it and then looking through it, you know. Hmm. I mean, three hours of footage might take me two months to go through and might end up with two or three images. Yeah. Great images, mind you. So, you know, it's it's worthwhile doing. So it's all it does work out if you if you're dedicated enough and you're willing to put in the time. Oh definitely, definitely, you, yeah. You know, so if anyone wants to repeat these experiments that you've done. Yeah. Um, well that's it because I'm bitten by the bug. I mean after I saw that UFO that Christmas evening, yeah. um, it was just, you know I mean I remember pinching myself because it was just like a dream. It was just so full on. And um, once you experience something like that, it's life changing. It is, yeah, it is. It's like a religious experience of some type, it's, as I imagine. It's well, you, you you suddenly realise that the world is not what you thought it was, and that things yeah, that other people, yeah. things that general society denies or ridicules, and makes a joke out of, you suddenly realise they're actually real. Well, that's the thing, yeah. And then you suddenly you're you're on, a, you're on a ninety degree angle to the rest of the of the world, and that's well, that's, it, that's yeah, a difficult I mean, situation to be in. I wanted to wake everybody up and bang on the doors and say, "Hey, everyone, UFO, UFO." Um, but you know, it was Christmas Day evening, and it just you know it's just crazy. I didn't know what to do. I was mm -hmm. absolutely panicking, and I knew I had to try and get um, a shot of it, even if I got a couple of frames of it. Mm -hmm. I had to get a photograph of what I saw that night, just so that I could show my friends and say, "Look, this is what I saw." Um, and the one image I did get, the one frame, um, showed exactly what I saw when it came over. Yeah. Um, right. That's. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, this has been really, it's been really interesting. I appreciate you. And the whole story is covered Talking in my book, Quest Invisibles, which yeah. you know, covers the first five years of my filming from seeing the actual UFO um, all the way through to you know the subsequent footage I captured in the infrared and the ultraviolet. Yeah. Um, so check that out. I mean, there'll be a link in the show notes to that. And of course, you saw the book earlier in the f in the film. Um, but Nick, uh, you'll be on. You'll be at Dreaming Sources. Oh, that's the book. Yeah. yeah. That's Quest the book Invisibles, again. Invisibles, Nick Mays. That's the book to look for. It's Ver available uh, worldwide from Amazon. BarnesandNoble.com yeah. and quite a few other sources. Pretty good, yeah. And then, um, so that's uh, that's how you get hold of the uh, his next book. And um, also, you're going to be at the Dreaming Sources event, and you're coming onto Hapanmo Radio soon as well. Yeah, I look so uh, that. we'll yeah, okay. so check if for those few of you, the few of you Hapanmo TV viewers who actually listen to Hapanmo Radio as well, because I know my, I, I know you're kind of two different, <laughs> you're two different communities. Um, but do, do, do check out a Panama Radio, please, and um, you'll get to hear from Nick and all, all the other interesting guests I have on there. But Nick, thanks very much. I appreciate you you uh, being on a Panama TV, mate. Oh, it's a pleasure. Anytime, anytime. It's great. It's nice to sit and chat to a like-minded person. Yeah, it's not easy, especially especially someone close enough, because yeah. we live just a few miles apart. Which is well, really that's good. it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much, mate. Cheers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was all very interesting. Uh, now, one thing I think that Nick's work has resolved is what lots of other researchers have sometimes noticed especially Trevor James Constable but also many others and that is that the UFOs have a a very very strange relationship with human senses um, different to other non-UFO objects for instance sometimes they're there sometimes they're not sometimes they're seen by some people not by others sometimes they can be um, they appear and then they suddenly vanish you look again and they're gone <coughs> this can be sometimes explained by fast movement, but sometimes they vanish while you're looking at them. And it's, it's also the fact that sometimes UFOs can be seen over a very built-up area uh, where there's lots of other people around, so in a crowded place, yet only one or two or a handful of the people actually see the UFO, not everybody. This is not always the case. The Phoenix Lights is a good example of a mass sighting, but very often you'll see, like... Uh, the encounter of Bridget Barclay is a, is a good example. This was a lady who was driving along a motorway in California, USA, and she had an encounter with a very, very distinctly 
visible saucer shaped craft yet none of the other drivers saw it that's a good example of that and of course this has encouraged skeptics to claim that UFOs are nothing more than a figment of the imagination they are basically uh, just they're, they're just they come from in here because this is why some people see them and some people don't is because they're hallucinations they are visible they're not visible at all our mind is simply creating them in our visual image of our visual cortex now um I think that's a rather convenient assumption which they make but it's I don't think it's true um, not least the other the other very very distinct evidence that UFOs are real which we have to take into account but also the fact that human vision I mean as much as <coughs> the hu human vision for when you're a human and you're looking through your eyes is a very rich experience it's it's a very very rich and varied and enjoyable and fascinating thing to be able to do people who lose their vision or their vision are impaired are severely disabled and have a great reduction in the quality of their life um, but when taking into account the amount of information that's out there the amount of material that is available human vision is extremely actually extremely limited it's a bit like peeping through a keyhole in fact you, you see around you, you think you see everything, you're actually just looking through a keyhole. Our eyes are detectors of electromagnetic radiation, but they can only detect electromagnetic radiation from on a wavelength of 400 to 700 nanometers and no more. This is what we call the, the vis this is what we call light, this electromagnetic radiation. So it's coming from that bulb over there and from that monitor screen over there and from that bulb up there and from the sun. Um, it's light, and um, this band, this very bar this band of 400 to 700 nanometers, is, is all we can see. The upper level of that band we call the color violet, and the lower end we call the color red. That's how we see it. Um, but it's, it seems that UFOs have the property of neither reflecting nor radiating electromagnetic radiation um, within that band. And many of them, they seem to have that property. This is one of the great discoveries that Nick has made. Um, why that is, I don't know. Whether it's something inherent about their nature, or maybe it's an, a, part, an, a part of their design that has been introduced artificially by whoever built them, or whatever built them, so they can operate secretly without being seen. It's what in science fiction is known as a cloaking device. That's what it's often called. Now, as far as the idea that there are biological entities out there which is which is what Nick postulates and I think in some cases he might be right not in all but maybe the void of space is not actually the sterile vacuum that we've been led to believe it is there are some fascinating UFO footages of objects that I'm sure this is a qualitative this is a qualitative assessment but they appear to resemble some kind of single-celled organism a good example is the 1996 um, space tether footage from the, from the space shuttle from NASA you see these pulsing round things which David Sarida talks about he sent them to Edgar Mitchell and Mitchell wasn't interested um, which is weird because Mitchell's supposed to be very into UFOs I can tell you a few more stories about him um, there's also some very very interesting um, footage from um, from both from astronauts but also from the ground which appears to so show snake-like objects uh, like going like that they look like snakes <clears throat> could these actually be living creatures could these be some sort of life maybe space m maybe space has become a home for some kind of biological creatures uh, maybe they maybe they developed on earth on, on earth or on another planet maybe they develop on planets and they evolve into beings that can fly in the vacuum the cold radioactive vacuum of space why not there are creatures on Earth that have evolved, or life originally was in the sea when it first started, and then some creatures came up onto land, and that was kind of, that was kind of a bit like that, you know, creatures co actually coming up onto land. And then they took to the air in the form of birds and other flying creatures. It's only one step beyond that for beings to go into space. You know what I mean? Oh, hold on a sec. Um... Why isn't that possible? 
maybe these maybe these these space serpents. Christopher Everard talks about them as well. Maybe they have to come back to, into the atmosphere occasionally to cool down or something, or maybe to take on water. Maybe they get dehydrated out there. I don't know. But maybe they there's creatures that actually when they're flying as birds or whatever, well they eventually evolve to fly higher and higher and higher. So eventually, natural selection and things like that and uh, survival of the fittest led them to become space creatures. Maybe they evolved on Earth and went out in space. Or maybe they evolved on other planets and they fly between the planets. Wouldn't that be exciting? Wouldn't that? And maybe some of them are... Maybe that's what Nick's detecting. His sky fish and his jellyfish and things like that are actually living creatures. They're not, they're not spaceships which contain living creatures. They are living creatures. Wow. That'd be quite something. And of course, if you remember my Exopolitics 2013 video, um, I think it was 2013, where the um, life in, it's the um, extraterrestrial life themed one, where Chandra Wickrama Singh was speaking. And now he's a guy who, with, together with Fred Hoyle, two great, the great, the famous great physicist, they discovered that, um, or they, they believe that out there is life. There's actually life in space. Space is actually full, it's packed with life. And life on Earth is just one small part of that. However, as I said before, the, the official view is that space is just this cold, empty, radioactive void of nothingness. And that the Earth is this tiny little oasis in this infinite cosmic desert. And it's one stretch to say, well, maybe there are creatures on other planets, like with SETI and things like that, and the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. I'm doing a special video about that soon. <coughs> to then say maybe they found us and they've come here, which is what UFOs are. To then say, well, maybe they're actually, they don't have to fly through space from other planets. Maybe they're already in space and space is their natural home. Now, um, there's, a, there's a book by Roald Dahl, which it's a children's book actually, which I did write when I was a ch read when I was a child. It's called the Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator. Now this is a sequel to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which is a much better, well, it's a much more well-known book. Uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, of course, has been made into several films. It's a real favourite. The Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator is the sequel to that. It's a very interesting uh, pair of books because they take place on, on, on in, during a single day, which is unusual for a novel. Uh, but this is the sequel goes up into they go up into space and uh, they encounter these things called the vermicious knids. We've got to pronounce the K. And these are like these sort of like oval shaped creatures which are grey and wrinkly. And they have these big eyes like that. And they have no mouths or anything like that. They, that's their only feature. But they actually live in space. They actually fly through space. I'm not saying Roald Dahl knew anything about this, but the author, I mean, it's just, it's just a kind of, it, it got me thinking about that, it just got me thinking. Um, so maybe that's what we're looking at. And stuff about Wilhelm Reich, I could, I could do an entire another video on Wilhelm Reich. In fact, I've mentioned him before, and I've done several videos about him. Oh, God, you could say a million things about that guy. Oh, yeah. But it seems like Nick has incorporated the work of Reich into what he does. And I think that's very, very interesting. I really want to say thanks very much to Nick Hayes. He's, he's been an absolute, he's a brilliant sport. He's been very hospitable. He's been very cooperative with me in the making of this film. And I, would, and I just really respect what he's doing. Um, and while strength of his arm, I hope that you know, he becomes better known. And maybe this video will help him become better known. There's also an article in UFO Truth magazine that's just been published in which I talk about Nick. So please do go to ufotruthmagazine.co.uk and subscribe because there's uh, there's the article I wrote there which is all about this and uh, well look out wait, wait for the Hopanmo radio show with Nick and also he'll be at the Dreaming Sources event which uh, I'll make a special video about that when the time comes and I'll make some more videos about um, about the various other issues I've raised within this one but as always Hopanmo TV viewers thank you very much for watching Hospital Porters Pride and Dignity stop the New World Order